a service of KIBMRadio.com, the Internet's home for an all-old-time radio. the innocent. Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned the homicide detail. A woman reports her sister is missing. The story she gives you indicates foul play. Your job, investigate. It was Tuesday, April 8th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of Homicide Division. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Lorman. My name's Friday. I was on my way back to the business office, and it was 11.46 a.m. when I got to room 42. Homicide. You know, it's just too bad to get a little faster on things like this. It's just too bad. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Joe. Hi. Ms. Moffat, this is my partner, Sergeant Friday. Joe, this is Mrs. Moffat. How are you, ma'am? How do you do? You want to tell him the story? You think it'll do any good? Yes, ma'am. Well, then, my sister's gone. Yes, Disappeared, and I want you to find her. When did you see her last? A couple of weeks ago. Could you give us a date? You have a calendar? Yes, ma'am, right on the wall there behind you. Oh. Well, this is eight. Maggie's birthday was in March, and that make it 14th of March. I see. She come by to thank me for the party. Had a few of the girls in for her. That's your sister? Yes, Margaret Shane. Have you heard anything from her since then? Not a peep. What about her home? Have you checked there? Tried to call her on the phone a couple of times. Didn't talk to her, though. Who'd you speak with? Her husband. Did you ask him where your sister was? Yes, I came right out with it. Didn't mince anything up. What'd he have to say? Well, then, just beat around. Didn't come out with a yay or no. Just beat around. Mm-hmm. How about the rest of her family? Isn't any. I'm the only living relative she has. Possible she's ill? If that's so, I'd know about it. We were pretty close. Hardly no secrets from each other. Mm, I see. Now, if you're all done asking me the same questions this fellow has, I want to know. I know there's something wrong. I want you to find out. All right, we'll check on it. I want you to do more than that, a lot more. Beg your pardon? I want you to arrest Maggie's husband. Well, why? Because he killed her. We checked the name and description of the woman through missing persons files, but we failed to find anything on her. While I talked to Karen Moffat, Frank went down the hall and ran the names Margaret Shane and her husband Gordon through R&I. There was nothing on either one of them. 1.06 p.m. We left the office and drove out to check the missing woman's house. Doesn't seem like anybody's home. Well, let's check the bank. Right. You think there's anything to it? You know, as much as I do, we both started from the same place. Yeah. I'll get it. Right. There was somebody home. Yeah. wonder why he didn't bark when he knocked on the door. Mm-hmm. There's nothing here. Let's check the garage there. Lock? Nope. Well, it's quite a shop, huh? Mm-hmm. A lot of tools. Well, doesn't look like anything. Nope. Somebody tried to hide it. Blood stains. We put in a call to the crime lab requesting that a crew be sent out to check the stains that we found on the floor. We talked to the neighbors about the couple and we got the address of the place where Mr. Shane was employed. It was a large wholesale carpet company. We found Shane in one of the offices. That's right. No, ma'am, if it's put in, it should make the room a lot warmer. No, the carpet you've chosen shouldn't show anywhere for years. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, we found that color doesn't show the dirt. No, oh, ma'am. Oh, well, it'll increase the value of your home. Oh, that's right. Oh, we can have it in for you day after tomorrow. That's right. I'll give you a call. Hmm? All right, bye. Yes, sir, can I do something for you? Mr. Shane? That's right. You want to come in? What can I do for you? Police officers. Frank Smith, my name's Friday. How are you, do, sir? Something wrong? No, sir, just a couple of questions we'd like to ask. Oh, sure. You want to sit down? Thank you. 
Cigarette? Yeah, thanks. Yeah. How about you, Mr. Smith? Yes, thanks, sir. Would like? I've got it. There you are. Thanks. Thanks. Now then, what's this all about? You know where your wife is, Mr. Shane? Oh, there's something about Maggie? Well, do you know where she is? Look, Mr. Friday, if there's something wrong with Maggie, I got the right to know about it. Yes, sir, that's true. We're not sure there's anything wrong. We'd like to talk to Mrs. Shane. We hope you tell us where we might reach her. Was she in trouble? No, sir. Well, then I don't understand all the questions. We've got a report that she's missing. Who filed it? Her sister. That figures. How's that? She is never going to stop. I don't believe I follow you. Karen's been hacked at me ever since I'm married, Maggie. Not a day goes by she doesn't plan some kind of a dig. Does she have a reason? Yeah. She had it all fixed for Maggie to marry someone else. I came along and upset her plans. Been trying to break us up ever since. That's all? Yeah. This fellow, she was trying to palm off on my wife. Karen's husband worked for him. She figured it'd be real soft having the boss as a brother-in-law. Well, the way it worked out, the slob had to work for a living. Almost kills Karen every time she thinks of it. Where is your wife? I wish I could tell you. What? I wish I knew where she was. Haven't you got any idea? No. A couple of weeks ago, I came home from work. Maggie was gone. I haven't seen her since. Can you pin it down? Uh, Thursday, a week. She called during the day to tell me she wanted me to go out to dinner. Said she wanted me to be home on time. I told her I wouldn't be able to make it. We had words. She hung up. When I got to the house, she was gone. She leave any kind of a note? Yeah. Have you got it? I don't think so. I was pretty upset. Guess I must have thrown it away. I haven't seen it around since. You know, you've got quite a woodworking shop in your garage. Yeah, yeah. Stuff's getting a little rusty now. I haven't felt like doing anything. Now, this trouble with your wife, was there another man involved? It'd be hard to say. What do you mean? Well, Maggie's an attractive girl. Everywhere she went, there was some guy trying to make time. Might have been someone special. I wouldn't know. Mm-hmm. wonder if we could use one of the phones outside. Use this if you like. Well, one of the others will do. Well, sure. Go ahead. I'll call over and see what they've come up with. Okay. This note your wife left, what did it say? You mean the exact words? If you remember them. It was pretty simple, just that she was leaving me, said she didn't have to tell me why, but I knew. Did she say where she was going? No. Figured maybe she went back east. She's got some friends there. Where? Nebraska, I think. I've never met them. How about clothes? What? Did she take any clothes with her? Oh, yeah, I guess so. She had quite a few. I looked at her closet. I couldn't tell what was gone. She took her fur coat, though. Mm-hmm. Did you try to contact any of her friends? I called around. I didn't find out anything. Mm-hmm. Oh, things are far, Sergeant. Isn't anything new about a wife leaving her husband? Read about it all the time in the papers. Karen's just stirring up trouble. She's sore at me. Always has been. Always will be. Joe. Yeah. Excuse me. Yeah, sure. Talk the lab. Yeah. They just finished the test on the blood stains. Mm hmm. We're not too far off. Huh? Human blood. Frank and I took Gordon Shane back to his house. During the ride, he was quiet and he refused to be led into a conversation about his wife. When we arrived at the house, we took him back to the garage. The crew from the crime lab had gone back to the office to make the grouping test on the blood stains. We should tell me what this is all about. We figure you might have the answer to that. When are you going to stop talking in riddles? Now, Shane, you know what we're after. You'll save yourself a lot of trouble if you go along with us. Well, I don't know. What are you after? You drag me away from my job, cause me a lot of embarrassment. Now, how about calling the game so we both know what we're playing? All right, huh? fine, sure. You got an explanation for this? What? The blood stains here on the floor. <laughs> yeah, sure. I killed a couple of people. This is where I did it. We don't need any jokes, Shane. Just figure it out. Well, you better turn in your deer stalker cap. I made those stains myself. Yeah? Huh? I was working on the lathe. Chisel slipped out of my hand, cut my foot. When did this happen? A couple of weeks ago. Before or after your wife left? Now you're ready to stop the game. It's a real easy question, Shane. Give us the answer the same way, will you? Before. How much? A couple of days. You told us your wife left on the 27th of March. Is that right? Yeah, I guess so. Is it right or isn't it? It's right. It's right. Then when did you cut your foot? The Sunday before. How do you pull that date up? Well, no trouble. It's the last time I worked out here. Oh, well, to cut that bad, it'd still be a mark, wouldn't it? Yeah. You mind showing us? Not at all. You know your blood type? Hmm? What's your blood type? Uh, oh. How about your wife's? I don't know. Somehow we never quite got around to talking about it. All right. Let's go in the house. You can show us your foot there. Yes, yeah, sure. You think you might be able to come up with a note your wife left as well? Well, look. You know much about the law? What do you mean? If I get out of this, can I bring suit against my sister-in-law? What's that? 
Well, it seems there should be something I can do to close her mouth. All the time Maggie and me were together, she was causing trouble. I'd like to really fix her good. That's a civil matter. You better see your lawyer about that. Oh, wait a minute. I'll get the door. We can talk in the living room. Where? Living room. All right. You want to go ahead? Yeah, yeah. This is the living room. You can sit down any place. All right. A little messy. I haven't spent a lot of time here since she left. Just toss those things on the floor. Don't worry about it. You want to see if you can find that note now? Yeah, I think maybe it's in the desk. I'll get it. Wait a minute. I'll have a look first. You guys don't trust anybody, do you? That's the way it's going to be. you got to go with it. All right. All right. Better make sure I haven't got a machine gun hidden in there. You know, you've done pretty good up to here, Shane. Don't press your luck. Yeah. You go ahead. Tear the place up. Too bad I haven't got a wall bed. You could look for her in there. It doesn't seem to make any difference to you that your wife left it all, does That's it? That's the way it looks. Yeah. Well, you ain't far off. Real load off my back. We've been married over four years, and all that time I haven't had a minute's rest. Thinking how she was going to run off with somebody else. Figured that she'd drop me. Now it's over. I don't have to worry anymore. You got it wrong, Shane. That's right. Yeah. Take a look, Joe. So what do you got there? You got no right to go through my personal things. When did you see your wife last? I'm not going to say anything more. You're trying to lead me into something. Looks like you found your own way. Now, how about it? I'm not going to talk anymore. All right. You call it any way you want. No matter how it turns out, you're going to carry the load. All right. She left on the 27th. Of That's the last time you saw her? Yeah. Have you heard anything from her since then? No. And I hope you got an answer for these. What do you got? A couple of checks made out to you, and they're signed by your wife. Well, what's that prove? The dates and the checks make a liar out of you, Shane. Huh? They were written a week after she left you. We made a search of the house, but we failed to turn up anything more that would tie Gordon Shane in with his wife's disappearance. We looked through the desk, and we found several letters that she'd written. These were taken for handwriting comparison. We also found several pictures of the missing woman. A check with the neighbors failed to give us anything further to work on. All of them told us of constant fights between Shane and his wife. One of the people said that on several occasions, the sound of sobbing had been heard coming from the house. At 5.20 p.m., Frank and I left the place and took Shane down to the city hall. The checks and samples of Mrs. Shane's writing were turned over to Larry Sloan for comparison. We put in a call to the crime lab, but we found that the blood grouping tests were not finished. 6.12, we took the suspect to the interrogation room. Just sit down over there, Shane. Okay. How long do you think you're going to be able to hold me? Depends on when we get the truth. Well, you saw the cut on my foot. You didn't find anything at the house. Look, you're grabbing at shadows. You still haven't told us about the checks. No reason to. Everything I say, you twist around so it ends up something I don't mean. Where'd you get the checks? From Maggie. What about the date on them? I don't know. I guess she made a mistake when they were written. Where'd you get them? Found them in the desk. Well, didn't you think it was kind of funny that your wife would write a couple of checks and just leave them laying around on the desk? No. Maggie was always doing something like that. She didn't care about money. How about you, Shane? Huh? Does it make any difference to you? Look, I'm getting tired of this. Some crazy old bag comes in here, tells you a fairy tale, and you buy it all away. Any special reason why you're taking my sister-in-law's word for it? The way she tells us seems to add up. Well, then, you better go over the column again. My wife walked out on me. There wasn't any fight when it happened. She just picked up and she left. I don't know where she is. I don't much care. But you put this down in your book. I didn't kill her. Now, now look, leave, leave, leave me alone. When do I get to call a lawyer? We'll set it up for you. Well, do it fast, because you're getting nothing more from me. That's the way you want it. There isn't any other way. I'm telling you the truth, and you don't believe it. Might as well keep my mouth shut so you can't make it any worse. All right, Gordon. We'll take you over to the main jail. You can call your lawyer from here. What are you holding me on? Suspicion of murder. You just don't give up, do you? Look, we got to go along with the evidence. Well, you better check it again, because you're making a mistake somewhere along the line. That's the way it looks to you, does it? Yeah. Go over the road again. Find that you're a cop. No, let's do it the easy way. Huh? You point it out. The suspect was removed to the main jail and held for further investigation. Frank checked the office, and I went down the hall to talk to Larry Sloan in handwriting. Joe, how's it going? You all through those checks, Larry? Just wrapping it up. All right, wait. Sure, sit down. Okay. What do you figure? I don't want you to tell us. Mm-hmm. How'd it start? Complaint. The woman wanted us to find her sister. Well, where did the checks fit in? Found them with the husband. Dates a couple of days after she disappeared. Mm-hmm. Figure he might have written them, huh? Well, that's one way. Mm-hmm. Well, that does it. Okay, what do you got? The endorsement on the back of Shane's writing. His signature. Yeah, here you can see it. No trouble there. The O's. Wave pulls the stroke down on the S. That's his. What about the writing on the face? Well, look here. 
shading on the G. Yeah. Where the crossbar on the T's pulled up. Uh-huh. These are the samples, and you got the same thing right here. No doubt about it, huh? Not with me. Okay. The woman wrote the checks. Joe. In here, Frank. Oh. Just talked with Lee at the crime lab. Yeah. He finished the grouping test. What did he find? Got in touch with Karen Moffat. Found out the missing woman's blood type. Yeah. Stains on the floor aren't hers. They belong to Shane. How you doing, Joe? Not good. Looks like we got the wrong man in jail, doesn't it? Listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. Frank and I left the office and went over to the main jail to see Gordon Shane. We talked to him for over an hour. He told us that he and his wife had been having trouble for quite a while and that they'd separated on several occasions. He went on to tell us that he didn't know for sure whether there was another man involved, but that he'd heard his wife spend a lot of time in a small bar on Vermont Avenue. He said that it was possible we could pick up some information on her there. Frank and I left the jail and drove over to the place. It was an average neighborhood tavern. We talked to the bartender. Only one way to describe her. Man, oh, man. Well, was there anybody special that Mrs. Shane spent a lot of time with, would you know? Mm, gee, I don't know. A lot of people in here like a family. Guess if you had to nail it down, it'd be Leonard. Who's Leonard? Another regular. He's here almost every afternoon. He and Mrs. Shane were pretty friendly, huh? Yeah, real buddies. They used to come in and get gas together, spend the whole afternoon, sit down there at the end and play horse, play it by the hour. Not for money. We don't allow that in here. What do you know about him? Not much. Doesn't figure him and Maggie had hit it off, though. Why do you say that? Well, it just doesn't. She liked her fellas big, you know, dark and handsome. Leonard's a little guy, not more than 5'4". Sure ain't anything to look at. What's his last name? Hmm? I think it's P-U-R-D-Y, Purdy. It seems like it's a... What's he look like? Hmm? Not much about him you'd remember. He's a little guy, blonde hair, real bad complexion. Has a mustache, you know, big kind of handlebar like. Yeah. You know where he lived? Not for sure. I think he's got a room over on Fountain someplace. I don't know the number. Where's your phone? Through the back door, though. Thanks. On the left. I'll check it, Jim. All right. This is pretty work for a living? No, regular. What's he do, do you know? He's some kind of salesman, door to door. I don't know what he peddles. Seen him a couple of times with a sample case, though. Has he been around lately? No. Hadn't thought about it, but I guess I haven't seen him in a couple of weeks. You ever hear what he and Mrs. Shane talked about? Word here and there. Nothing you could put together. I think she spent the time with him because she didn't have to worry about it. How do you mean that? Well, you know, a little guy like that. Couldn't give her no trouble. He's always around. Maggie didn't have a car, so Leonard would drive her if she wanted to go someplace. What kind of a car? 41 DeSoto. Parked it out back a couple of times. It's a real wreck. All right. What'd she do? Huh? Maggie, what are you after her for? Like I said, we'd like to talk to her. Sure, a doubt you get to know her. After that, doesn't matter how much money she spends, she can't switch you back. She spent quite a bit in here, did she? Yeah. Her and Leonard had really put the drinks away. Both of them had hollow legs. You know, I've seen some pretty heavy drinkers walk up against them. They don't stand a chance. Maybe you can really put it away. It always causes trouble. What do you mean? It's loud. Yelling all over about how she could buy and sell everybody in a place. A couple of times, I had asked her to get out. Things like that hurt business, you know. She carry a lot of money with it, did she? Oh, yeah. I always had a bundle. Said she was an heiress or something. I don't know. She was always loaded, though. Mm-hmm. Anything on Purdy? Yeah, sure is. Yeah? Got out of state mental hospital six months ago. From his package, we found that Leonard Purdy had been arrested several times for suspicion of grand theft. However, he hadn't been convicted on any of them. Also, there were 18 drunk arrests against him. We put in the call to Georgia Street Psycho Detail, and we talked to Lieutenant Quinn. He remembered Purdy, and went on to say that the suspect had been in to see him several times since his release. He told us that Purdy had committed himself to the state hospital as an alcoholic. Quinn went on to say that when Purdy was drunk, he became violent, and that on three of his arrests, it had taken several officers to subdue him. We contacted the authorities up at Camarillo. They told us that the suspect had been released by them after treatment, and that he apparently was cured. We checked the last address in his package, but we found that he'd moved. A local and an APB was gotten out on him. We asked DMV to furnish any and all information on a car registered to him. Two days went by without a word of him. In the meantime, we talked to all of his friends and acquaintances. From each one of them, we got the same story. Leonard Purdy was a freeloader who'd do anything for a dollar. 
On Thursday, April 10th, we got word that the suspect had been seen in a second-hand store down on Main Street. We checked the area and got an identification from his mug shots. He'd come in to pawn a man's watch. From the buy book, we got an address out on Gladys Avenue. We talked to the landlady and found that the suspect was in his room. Frank and I went upstairs. Is that, huh? No. Want to talk to you, Purdy? Just a minute. Yeah, what do you want? You Leonard Purdy? That's right. Who are you guys? Police officers want to talk to you. I got nothing to do with cops. I have my fill up. Yeah. Why don't you come in? Right. Yeah. You can be here long? Not long. That's good. I don't feel like making small talk. <clears throat> I'd offer you a drink, but there's just barely enough for me. You can understand. Put the glass down, Purdy. What? Put it down. But you got no right to come in here and tell me what to do. Nobody asked you. Oh, no. oh, no, Miss McCloskey. This fur coat belong to you, Purdy? Yeah, I get cold now. You know a woman by the name of Margaret Shane? Never heard of her. You sure about that? I'm sure, I'm sure. I got nothing to answer to you. Before you come in here and tell me what to do, I don't have to give you one single answer about nothing. You better come up with one. What's that? This coat. What about it? It's got Margaret Shane's name in it. Well, it must be a mistake. I don't know anybody named Shane. Nobody. We got a lot of people who say you do. You tell me the truth? Same people tell us you were with her when she disappeared. They don't know what they're talking about. The way they put it, it's pretty straight. Who told you? Who? Just give me some names. Everybody we talked to. They said I was with That's her? That's right. Now, where is she? I don't know. You got to do better than that. No, it's the truth. I don't know where she is. Mm-hmm. I killed her, but I don't know where she is. the suspect down to the city hall and questioned him. He finally sobered up enough to tell us that he'd gotten into an argument with a Shane woman and he'd beaten her to death. He went on to say that his car was being repaired and that he'd rented one and driven it out into the desert. He buried the victim there. We showed him maps of the area, but he was unable to tell us where to find the body. He only knew that he'd put it in the culvert along the roadside. We got the name of the automobile rental agency and we called them. Their records gave us the date of the rental and the mileage the car had been driven. We put the suspect in our car and started out toward the Mojave Desert. As we drove, Purdy verified our route. By dividing the total mileage in half and figuring the distance between his house and the office of the auto rental company, we had a vague idea where to start looking. After we'd been driving for over two hours, we pulled to the side of the road. How's the look around here? Yeah, it might be it. I think up the road a little way. Remember that big rock over there? Remember that pretty good. It's up ahead a little. All right. We drove for another 30 minutes, and then Purdy directed us to pull off onto a dirt road. We drove another half a mile, and we came to the end of the road. We can't go any further. Don't have to. Huh? I remember now. Let's get out of the car. Just stay close to us, Purdy, right here. All right. Which way? Over here. Sure, beautiful day. Yeah. It's different when you get out in the country. Everything's got a different color. Come on, Purdy. Where is she? Over there, behind the bushes. I'll go look. Always been the big trouble. What's that? Boozing it up. Every time I get a few drinks, I don't know what I'm doing. But after I got out of the hospital, I had it made, you know. I'd be able to stay away from it. Yeah. First time I had trouble, I went back. I always went back. How about it? Yeah. She's there. All the time, that's what caused the trouble. Wouldn't be if it wasn't for me boozing it up. Mm-hmm. If I could just stay away from it, I wouldn't have any problems. I, I want to give it up if I could just find a way. You got one now. The story you have just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On August 14th, trial was held in Department 98, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. <laughs> Leonard Eiler Purdy pled guilty to murder in the second degree and received sentence as prescribed by law. Murder in the second degree is punishable by imprisonment for a period of from five years to life in the state penitentiary. Dragnet. 
The story of your police force in action is a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. My name's Regan. I work for Anthony J. Lyon, Detective Bureau. They call me the Lion's Eye. Wednesday at 9 and CBS brings you Jeff Regan, Investigator, starring Paul Dubov as Regan with Frank Nelson as Anthony J. Lyon. So stand by for mystery and suspense and adventure in tonight's story titled... It all comes back to me now. She was about medium-sized, brunette, beautiful, and bewildered. She couldn't remember where she'd come from or where she was going. Couldn't remember her own name. Just one thing she could remember. She wanted to commit murder. She was in the office of my boss, Anthony J. Lyon, that Friday morning, sitting there across the desk from him, holding onto her battered purse like it was the last thing in the world she was sure of. But the Lyon or I didn't know, she was right. Oh, Jeffrey, come in, come in. I- I've been waiting for you. Morning, Fatso, new client? Uh, well, uh, yes, yes, Jeffrey, I think we could call her that. Uh, uh, Jeffrey, this is Miss, uh, Miss... Uh... That's a very interesting name, Fatso. My name's Regan, Miss... Miss. Well, how do you do, Mr. Regan? Uh, Jeffrey, she has a terrible problem. Somebody does. She can't remember her name. Please. Please, can't you help me? I don't remember anything. You remember how you got here to our office? No. Not anything. From when? Well, from, from now. Except, uh, there was a door. It, it said detective agency. I, I, I walked in. Uh, yes. Uh, Jeffrey, what are we going to do about Miss, uh, Miss, uh, 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 Smith? Smith? Well, we've got to call her something, haven't we? All right, Smith. Jeffrey, this is a matter for the police. A Bureau of Missing Persons, surely... Oh, we... no, Miss Lyon, please. Not the police. What's that? Oh, please, Mr. Regan, please don't let him call the police. People who can't remember their names usually can't remember they shouldn't go to the police, Miss Smith. But I... Look, lady, if you don't want to go to the cops, there's got to be a reason. Well, then... Then... Look at this. Be Jeffrey. 32 caliber revolver, Smith & Wesson. Loaded except for two empty shells. You see, Mr... Uh, Mr. Uh, the, the gun's been fired, Jeffrey. Two bullets missing. Miss Smith? I... I don't know. Hey, Jeffrey, that's Kenneth. Did we call Lion, the police? I think Miss Smith hasn't quite finished her story. The gun in her purse isn't the only reason she doesn't want to go to the police. Is that right, Miss Smith? Mr. Regan, I, I try to remember. There was a, a house somewhere, a small house. I was in a room with... Go on. No. No, I can't. Keep trying, Miss Smith. I, uh, 
I was going somewhere. Alone. I wanted to see someone. Hey. I think I was on my way to kill someone. Patch will get some water. She's fainted. Here, water. Jeffrey, don't just stand there. Call an ambulance. The lion was right. Miss Smith wasn't just a quick faint. Her breath came in short, hushed spurts, and her pulse was a whisper. Beside her, the battered little purse had fallen open. Inside, two dollars and seventeen cents and a receipt for cab fare. No wallet. No identification. I picked up the receipt. It was dated that morning, Friday, and totaled three dollars and seventy cents. It was a lead. I sent the line with Miss Smith in the ambulance and then headed for the main office of the cab company. It took me two hours to get what I wanted. The receipt was for cab number 702, one of the new cars the company added. And it was usually driven by one Joseph Rupnick. Another hour passed, and he pulled into the cab stand out front of the main office. Joe Rupnick? Who else? Let's drive. My flag is down. Where to, Mac? Did you drive a medium-sized brunette this morning, Joe? Ah, oh, it'd be a pleasure. Think. Fair complexion, good-looking, very good-looking. Carried a little black leather purse. The fare was $3.70. Three seventy, yeah? Huh? You know, it's a nice fare. What'll it buy, three seventy? Well, let's see. Three seventy should ought to take you out to Westwood. You got a record of your stops today. What about Westwood? Yeah, I guess I have. Hey, Mac, what do you know? She was lovely. She was engaged, and she used my cab. Oh, what a dish! Bewitched, bothered, and brunette. I seen her, and I'm glad. Never mind the tone poems. Where did you pick her up? In Westwood. Where else? Okay, let's go there. is it, Mac? Right here on this corner. She was standing here. Naturally, I stopped. Naturally. Thanks. See you around. No, you're welcome, but I'm staying. Staying where? Now, look, right here, Mac. Look. You don't have to be a mind reader to spot you for a private eye. Shamus, a gumshoe. This means the jackpot. My cab is at your service. That's your business, Joe. Only keep your flag up. Shouldn't worry about a thing. Besides, when else do I get a chance to check the horses at time for it? Joe Rupnick pulled a racing form out of his pocket, and I looked at the place he pointed out. According to Joe, Miss Smith had been standing in front of a white, one-story building with a two-story sign that said, Parker Service. It was an auto repair shop, a big one, the kind that specializes in foreign cars, custom sedans, and rich customers. Mr. Parker, telephone call, Mr. Parker. Yes, sir. And what can I do for you, uh, uh, sir? I, I am looking for a girl. She uh, she used to work here. Sarah? You're looking for Sarah? About medium size, good looking. Yeah, yeah, that's Sarah. Well, she quit yesterday. She was in here this morning to pick up her check. Me, I'm just taking her place. And it's not a bad job. Not bad at all. Mr. Parker, he's a nice guy. A very nice guy. Oh, give... pardon me just a moment, please. Parker service? Yeah. Yeah, just a moment, please. Uh, could you give me Sarah's address? Huh? Uh, could you give me Sarah's address? Well, I could check for you. You see, I'm new here at I. Sure. Uh, by the way, what's Sarah's last name? I've forgotten. Sarah Hanson. <laughs> so you didn't know her very well, did you? Line dates. Oh, yeah. I understand. And she forgot to give you her address. Sure, I'll find out for you, mister. <laughs> Glad to. The girl behind the counter winked at me and went back into the office. And before I could turn around, there was somebody at my elbow. And I, I had that feeling you get when you know someone's staring down your neck. I turned and I was right. Tall man, neatly dressed, business suit, about 35. Suntan that spelled 18 holes of golf on Sunday, private club, chamber of commerce. I beg your pardon, sir. Did I overhear you asking for Sarah Hanson? Maybe you did. My name's Parker. Mine's Regan. I wonder if you'd be kind enough to step into my office. 
Okay. This way, Mr. Rico. You see, I happen to be particularly interested in the girl, Miss Hanson. She's unusually intelligent, a superior worker. I hated to see her leave. Here we are, Mr. Regan. Have a chair. A cigarette? No, thanks. Let's stick to Miss Hanson. Oh, yes, Mr. Regan. I was quite curious at your interest in Sarah Hanson. She, uh, she's not the sort of girl to have many, shall we say, gentlemen friends. Really? What sort of girl is she? Well, more on the quiet side. Intelligent, as I've said, and not at all emotional. Sarah was a very superior, superior worker. worker. Come on, Parker, I haven't got all day. A girl quit her job and you want to know why. Is that it? Well, I'm curious. There's more to it than that. I saw four secretaries in your front office alone. One named Sarah wasn't that good. Very well, Mr. Regan. I'm going to tell you the truth. Certain malcontents, certain vicious elements in my organization, irresponsible rumor mongers have been saying that Miss Benson and I... Well, there isn't a word of truth in it. I'm still listening. I'm a happily married man, Mr. Regan. You understand what rumors of this sort do. Well, go on. I'm going to put a stop to it. You understand? Once and for all, oh, I'm going Okay, to... okay. Take it easy, Parker. <laughs> I'm sorry I lost my temper, Mr. Regan. This thing has been gnawing at me for months. That's why I finally discharged Miss Hanson. That's what you've been trying to say. You fire Sarah Hanson. You think that's why I'm here? Well, uh, yes, I... It's just a job, Mr. Parker. We all got to make a living. Somewhere in it, a story was beginning to take shape. Parker apologized again, and I left his private office. Out front, the receptionist has Sarah Hanson's address, and I took it. When I got to the street, Joe Rutnick's cab was still sitting there. Up in, Mac. I'm available. You find the gun? No, but I've got an address. Great. I've got them all lined up for tomorrow at Tampa for Ann. Let's go. It was past Pico on Bentley. It took us five minutes to pull up in front of a bungalow converted into a duplex. I left Joe with his racing form and newspaper and went up to the door that belonged to Sarah Hansen. I rang the doorbell. No answer. I knocked. Same results. The sun was sinking somewhere in the distance and the early mist the prelude to fog was settling in fast. I tried the doorknob. No results. And then something told me to get inside that apartment, to get in with or without a permit, with or without a key. I walked around back until I found a window unlocked. The screen was easy, and I climbed up. My stomach scraped across the windowsill... And I was inside. Dark, dank, stale-smelling air. Something foul and disagreeable I wanted to turn and leave and get out of the stinking apartment. But I didn't. Instead, I moved slowly along the wall in the darkness and fumbled until I hit the light switch. The lights didn't change the smell. But it told a story. Chairs upside down. Picture frame smashed to the floor, two dishes broken in a thousand pieces, and the sofa cushions on top of each other in a corner. The whole place turned upside down, looking like a clapboard shack after a hurricane. I moved into the living room, picking up pieces, searching for anything, and I found something. In front of the imitation fireplace on the carpet, a pool of blood. Hey, Mac, you okay? Yeah, Joe. Look, Mac, I think I got something important. Be there in a minute. Never mind. I'll climb through the window. Hey, look, Mac, I want you to take a look at this. I was reading while I was waiting for you. Early edition of the afternoon paper. Yeah, yeah. Look on page two. You find it, Mac? Yeah, I found it. I found it. Story on page two. 
the body of a girl found washed up on Will Rogers State Beach, tentatively identified as Sarah Hansen. This is CBS, and you are listening to tonight's adventure with Jeff Regan, investigator, entitled, It All Comes Back to Me Now. CBS brings you many of the most exciting programs on the air. For example, Sundays at 5.30, A Face in the Shadows, A Bloodstained Bernouse, A Beautiful Dancing Girl may set Rocky Jordan on an exciting adventure in ancient Cairo. Follow Rocky Jordan as he moves through the dangerous streets of the capital of Egypt. Meet Rocky Jordan this Sunday at 5.30 on CBS. And now, back to tonight's story titled, It All Comes Back to Me Now, and Jeff Regan, Investigator. Joe, the cab driver, stepped on the gas, and we headed for the police. I sat in the back seat, the folded newspaper in my lap, and tried to make sense out of a story so twisted even the principal characters no longer made sense. A girl with amnesia hires the lion and me to help her find herself. She says she remembered wanting to kill someone. She collapses, and I follow a lead to a cab driver, to a repair shop in Westwood, to the home of one Sarah Benson... That was when I read the early afternoon paper which said a girl had been found washed up on Will Rogers State Beach. Her name? Sarah Hansen. It was getting late. Street lights turned on, traffic jamming and hawking its way up sunset. But that didn't stop Joe Rupnick from hitting 40 between the cars. We made the police station at 6.45. Okay, thanks, Joe. That does it. What do you think, I'm leaving? Me, a sucker for a mystery? I gotta know how this comes out. It took me 15 minutes to get to Lieutenant Candid. Hi, Regan. Candid, I got a couple of questions. Yeah. Regan, I am tired to the very bottom of my large, flat feet. Let's make it tomorrow. It can't wait. All right, Regan. What's her name? Listen, Candid, all I want to know is where you got your identification for Sarah Hansen. Sarah Hansen, age 27, height 5'4", weight... My 117 hair, blonde eyes, brown. Blonde. That's what I said, wasn't it? You fished her up off Santa Monica? Uh, you know, Will Rogers State Beach. We didn't find her. Some swimmers did. They called. You weren't looking for her? Looking. We didn't know Sarah Hansen from my friend Irma. What's eating you, Regan? Canter, just tell me something else. Who identified the girl for you? Only her mother and father and brother and sister, that's all. Okay, Candid, sorry I bothered you. It's all right. We can't find the murder weapon. We haven't got a lead on the killer, and i got to talk to you yet. She was shot? Two slugs in her chest. Thirty-two. Maybe Smith and Wesson. Gun's missing. That part of it wasn't in the papers. Uh, don't we look bad enough already without making it worse? All we got on this case is a body. Even if it is a nice one. When was she killed, Candid? Uh, this morning, somewhere between 1 and 2 a.m., the coroner says. That isn't all. What else? Well, from the tire marks they found up the beach, there was another idea. We think maybe she was shot somewhere else and then driven down to the beach. This so... Sarah Hansen, she worked? Yeah, a place out in Westwood. Called, uh, Parker's Service. Yeah, we'll check everyone out there. Takes time. What about an address, Candid? Where did she live? Well, the parents say she moved out of their place a couple of months ago. Seems they had a fight, as she and the parents. She wouldn't tell them where she was moving. they tell you anything else? Uh, Sarah Hansen was afraid of something, they said. Had them worried. That's when the fight started. She used to get phone calls from a woman. A woman? Yeah, every time this woman called, Sarah would leave the phone crying. Only happened a couple of times. Did they ever see this woman? Nope. They were wondering if it might be another girl who worked with Sarah. You know, few... Only you haven't checked the employees yet. Like I said, Regan, it takes time. The shop opens up first thing in the morning. My men will be there. Thanks, Candid. Thanks a lot. Hey, Regan, where do you fit in this? Why, I'm Candid. You know how it is. Maybe I don't, Regan. If you know something... I don't know anything, Candid. You wouldn't lie to me, would you? 
Sarah Hansen was a good-looking dame. A real good-looking dame. I never met her. You sure, Regan? I'm sure. Okay, I'll take your word. She's a real nice-looking dame, like I said. Kind you hate to see turn up dead. You want to see her, Regan? All right, Candid. We'll see her. Candid and I went to the morgue. We saw her. Sarah Hansen. Medium-sized, good-looking blonde. She looked nothing like the girl who'd come to the lion's office without a memory. Yet somewhere, Sarah Hansen and Miss Smith fit together. Somewhere their lives became crossed and tangled up and then went separately again. Miss Smith, to a blank memory. Sarah Hansen's to death. Somewhere something made both things happen. That gave me an idea. I went upstairs to missing persons and checked every record I could find that even faintly resembled our client, Miss Smith. Nothing did. I headed outside. Joe Rupnick was still sitting in the taxi. He turned it around, and we headed for the L.A. County Hospital. Jeffrey, there you are. Trouble, Fasso? Trouble? I've been sitting here all day, wasting time and money. How's she doing, Fasso? Is she? Oh, Miss Smith, fine. She's doing fine. Doctor says she was merely weak from too much tension brought on by the amnesia. Good, Lion. I think we may have something. We may have something. You're darn right we have something. Hospital bills, doctors, nurses' bills. Every time the door opens to that girl's room, I add another five dollars. Jeffrey, this is ridiculous. We're not Fort Knox. How do you think the Lion Detective Agency can pay for this? Take it easy, Fatso. Remember, it was your idea to bring Miss Smith here. So what if it was my idea? That's right, Lion. You call the ambulance. Well... Well, that's no reason why we have to pay. Mr. Lyon, I'll have to ask you not to raise your voice. Uh, 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 yes, Miss Wilson. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Lyon. Yes. Sitting here all day, wasting your time. Oh, now, Jeffrey, after all, a man has to do something. Sure, Fatso. You keep an eye on those nurses' bills. I'm going in to see our client. Miss Smith was lying there, pale face made paler by the whiteness of the sheets, the white hospital walls, the clinical smell of the room. You don't have to be sick to look sick in a hospital bed. Oh. Hello, Mr. Regan. You remember me? <laughs> you helped me, Mr. Regan. I won't forget that. What does the doctor say? Oh, I'll be all right. Really, I will. It's just my mind. I can't think straight. But you remember about the gun, the two bullets missing? Yes. Yes, I remember about them. Do you remember anything more? I don't think so. About wanting to kill someone? Oh, Mr. Regan. You don't remember that part of it? The doctor says it's... it's he says it's, it's shock. Something happened to me. Something I wanted to forget... Made me forget everything. Murder might do that. Yes, I, I. I suppose it might. Does the name Parker mean anything to you? No. Parker Service, Westwood? No, Mr. Regan. How about Sarah Hansen? No, Mr. Regan, I don't know that name. Sarah Hansen, a blonde, pretty blonde. No. No, 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 I don't remember. You worked for Parker Service in Westwood. You were in Westwood today. Maybe no. in a small apartment no, on Bentley Regan, just past Pico. That, that mean anything to you, Miss Smith? Leave me alone. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. Okay, thanks. Thanks anyway. Please leave me alone. Mr. Regan, leave me alone. Somewhere the paths of Sarah Hansen and Miss Smith crossed. Somewhere their lives were woven in and out of each other until it was so mixed up and... And it made sense. Simple, quick, easy sense. I left the hospital in a hurry. The cab was there and I got in and we drove and drove fast. First for a drugstore and a phone booth, then for Westwood. Look, Mac, now that we're here, what do we 
doing here? Visiting Joe. Yeah, it don't sound friendly somehow. You sit tight. I'm going in. Look, that house is dark. Nobody's home, Mac. Maybe, maybe not. If I'm not out in ten minutes, get to a phone and call the police. You got that? Yeah. Call the cops. It was 50 feet back from the street. Not a mansion. Not a little house. Grounds well kept, lawn neat and trimmed. I moved slowly up the walk toward the front door. The fog had settled on Westwood Village and the soft dampness sifted under your clothes made your skin turn cold. Up ahead, the dark house, waiting. I changed my mind, moved along the side of the house toward the fireplace. That might mean den, and the den might mean proof. Around back, a patio and French doors next to the red brick. Still no sounds from the dark house. I tried the French doors. It was the den. Books, heavy leather chair, and desk. On the desk a photograph, too dark to see. I picked up the metal frame and lit a match. It fit. The final nail in a murderous coffin. You like the photograph? Get your hands off your gun, Mr. Regan. That's better. Only one of us needs a gun just now. Just you, Parker. The photograph is almost a perfect likeness, isn't it? Beautiful woman. But not beautiful enough for you, was that it? Beautiful but possessive. She didn't understand me. And Sarah Hansen did. Jane killed her. So that's her name, Jane Parker. Too bad you've never met her, Mr. Regan. I've met her, Parker. In fact, I just left her less than 30 minutes ago. It's a lie. You've never met my... Your wife, Jane Parker. She, she asked for help. Regan, you're lying. You tell me a better story. Where is your wife? I... I don't know. But you'd like to, wouldn't you? You'd like to know so you could see her once more, so you could see her and shut her up. She told you. Did you kill Sarah Hansen? She was lying. She killed Sarah. There was a fight. Jane killed her in a jealous rage. And you're going to try to tell me Jane carried Sarah Hansen to her car, then took her to the beach, and then threw her body in the... I left. I don't know what happened. It was Jane. Jane carried a woman her size down to the ocean. Who do you think you can make believe that? You're lying. I'll tell you what really happened. Jane found out you were running around with another woman, Sarah Hansen. She phoned Sarah, tried to reason with her. Your wife was dumb enough to want to keep you... When Sarah wouldn't listen to reason, your wife went to see her. You don't know what you're talking about. She found you at Sarah Hansen's apartment on Bentley. There was a fight. You lost your temper, Parker. Only a man your size could erect the place the way it is now. No. You shot and killed Sarah, and the shock was too much for your wife. No. Her mind went blank, went completely blank, rather than remember the nightmare she'd seen. How, how do you know? How? Because I know where your wife, Jane Parker, is right now. She didn't tell you that. She wouldn't dare tell you. Your wife disappeared after the shooting early this morning, didn't she, Parker? You didn't know where she'd gone. That's what you really wanted to find out from me when I was at your shop this you're afternoon. You're making that up. You were afraid then and you're afraid now. Yet you didn't report to the police that your wife was missing. I checked that. You didn't want them to find her either. She could tell the real story. Where is James to be? You're wasting time. Unless you tell me where my wife is, Mr. Regan, I'll put every bullet in this gun through your body. And that still wouldn't stop your wife from talking, would it, Parker? That still wouldn't give you the answer to where she is now. Tell me, Regan. Go ahead. Go ahead. Shoot, Parker. Shoot and read the morning papers tomorrow. The headlines will tell how every cop on the West Coast is waiting to shoot you on sight. Regan! So you won't need that gun! Let go! You pull the trigger on yourself, Parker. Too bad your aim wasn't better. Dr. Dana. Dr. Stephen Dana. Sixteen dollars a day for room. A private nurse. Hi, Hi, Paso. No, don't bother me, Jeffrey. I'm very busy. A room at sixteen dollars a day. How's our client, Lion? She doing okay? Sixteen dollars a day. Hmm? Yeah, what's that, Jeffrey? Miss Smith, our client. No, oh, you mean Jane Parker. Oh, why didn't you say so, Jeffrey? She's much better. The doctor says it'll take time, though. Yeah, let me see now. If you take 16... Do you think she'll get her memory two, back, Lion? Two, uh, what? No, oh, oh, yes, yes. He thinks it's just a matter of time. Uh, mental block, that sort of thing. Very complicated, you understand. Oh, hey, Jeffrey, it's been a long day. You must Dr. be tired. Johnson, I am a little. Come on, Fatso, I'll drive you home. Uh, me? Mm-hmm. Go home? Uh, uh, no, no you, you just run on, Jeffrey. I, I, I really couldn't leave just yet. You, you see, I've got it figured so the city will have to pay oh, for the hospital. Oh, you can figure expenses. that out at home, Fatso. You look tired. Well, uh, 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 no, no. You, you see, Jeffrey, I, I'd better stay right here where I can get the course first hand. 
That way I'll have it accurate when I charge the city. You know me, Jeffrey. <laughs> business before pleasure. Oh, yes, business before pleasure. Yes, I'm not satisfied until I've completely finished the case. You look peaked, boy. You run along, get some sleep. Me? Well, I'll just sit here and work. Finish my job. I'm all ready, Mr. Lyon, if you are. Yeah. The night supervisor said it would be all right if I left early. Yeah. Isn't that just grand? Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, good night, Jeffrey. Good night, Fatso. <laughs> Jeff Regan, Investigator, was written tonight by William Frug, produced and directed by Sterling Tracy, and stars Paul DeBob as Regan with Frank Nelson as Anthony J. Lyon. Original music is by Dick Arant. Jeff Regan, Investigator, is heard each week at the same time over CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. signal at Washington Boulevard in Normandy, and suddenly the car door opened, and a man jumped in the car. I, I was scared, and I let out a yell. Mm-hmm. Which door did he open? Well, on the passenger side. He got right in the front seat beside me. All right. He had a knife in his hand. He said not to scream, or he'd stab me. Put the knife right against my ribs, right, right here. Mm-hmm. Then he said to drive straight ahead. I did. We went a couple of blocks, I guess it was, and... Then he said to stop the car. When I pulled over the curb, another man got in the car, in the, in the back seat. Mm-hmm. The one with the knife told me to get in the back seat. And when I did, he gave the knife to the other man. Then he started to drive. Mm-hmm. And the man in the back took my purse from the front seat and started go, going through it. I, I don't know why I did, but I, I grabbed for it. That was a mistake. Mm-hmm. He slapped me real hard. He said that was just a sample. I'd get some more if I didn't just sit quiet. He took the money I had my bill filled and he grabbed my arm and he twisted it so he saw I had a watch on. And I hesitated when he told me to take it off and then he hit me again. He took your watch too, did he? Yeah, and my ring too. Uh, can you give us a serial number on the watch? Uh, yes, I have it written down at home. 
Well, we need a description of the ring, too. All right. Would you go on, please? Uh, sure, I'd wind up as a picture and a headline in tomorrow's paper, one way or the other. Well, how do you mean that? Well, he was driving like a maniac. He's breaking all kinds of laws. Yes, ma'am. But then I thought, well, maybe this might be a good thing. He's driving like that, I mean, because a police car started chasing us. I could hear the siren, and I thought I saw the red lights flashing. Mm -hmm. I was hoping they'd catch us, but, well, somehow we got away from him. This man took so many chances and all. No wonder we didn't smash up sooner. You mean that you did have an accident later on? We don't know about that. No. Well, after he got away from the police car, this man kept driving real crazy and dangerous. Finally, we went down a dead-end street. He put on the brakes, but it was too late, and we smashed into a wall of some kind. Yeah. And they got out of the car, and they started running. I started screaming. Mm-hmm. Well, anyhow, some man came out of a building. I, I told him what had happened, and he called the police and the ambulance. Here I am. So some shaky, but... Thankful it wasn't any worse. Can you give us a description of these two men? Well, not much, I'm afraid. That makes me feel pretty stupid, too. What do you mean, ma'am? Well, I'm always doing those observation tests in magazines. I could get real high ratings, and when I'm up against the real thing, I fail miserably. Can you give us a general idea of their age, their coloring, their height, the way they were dressed? I, I, I don't think they were too old. Maybe around 20 or so. Mm -hmm. They had dark hair. I can't tell you how tall they were. The only time I saw them standing up was when they ran away from the car. Okay. As I remember, the one that drove had on a sport coat, tan color. And the one in the back had on a brown suede jacket. You know, the kind with the knit cuffs and the collar and the waist. That's about all I can remember. I'm sorry. That's all right, Miss Olson. We appreciate the fact you're under a pretty bad strain. I really thought they'd kill me. Yes, ma'am. You remember if they were clean-shaven? Uh, you mean that they have mustaches? That's right. No, they didn't. Well, you remember if either of them had any scars or marks on their faces, anything distinguishing that might help us identify them later? Well, if they did, I didn't see any. But... Well, there was one thing. I don't know if it means anything. Yeah. The one that was driving had a bandage on his thumb. I could see that because he... He held the steering wheel up near the top. On which hand? The right one. It was all wrapped up, you know, all, all around, not just an adhesive kind. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry I can't give you more information. That didn't make me happier than for you to catch them. Especially the one that kept hitting me, the one in the back seat. Yes, ma'am, I understand. I think he enjoyed it. He grinned when he did it. After I made the mistake of grabbing for my purse, I, I tried not to give him a reason to hit me again. It didn't help. It just hit me when he felt like it. No reason at all. It really wouldn't have made any difference what you did, ma'am. How do you mean, Mr. Friday? Men like that. Yeah? They don't need a reason. <laughs> we continued to question Gwen Alston, but she could add nothing further that would aid us in identifying the suspects. She did give us a description of the ring. She said she would call and give us the serial number of her watch. She couldn't tell us anything about the knife used to intimidate her other than the fact that it had a blade about six inches long. We asked her to come down to the city hall and check the mug books. Dr. Hall released the victim and she returned home in the company of her brother. The radio unit that had answered the call had gotten out a local broadcast on the two suspects. They impounded the victim's car and it had been moved to the official police garage. 9.37 p.m. Frank and I drove over to Wall Street. The crew from Leighton Prince had just finished going over the car. Hi, Joe, Frank. Hi, right, Harlow. Hello, how are you? You fellas draw this one? Yeah. You going to give us some help this time? Yeah, just finishing. It doesn't look too good. Yeah? Got a couple of partials. Nothing real clean. Well, what we got from the victim, it looks like we got our work cut out for us on this. What do you mean, Joe? Well, all she could give us in the way of a description would fit any number of guys. I see. Well, we got something out of the back seat that might be some use to you. What's that, Harlow? I got it right here in an envelope. There you are, Joe. What's this? Well, that aluminum container has some corneal lenses in it. What do you mean? Eyeglasses. You know, the kind that fit right in the eye. Oh. Where'd you find them? In the back seat, right on top of the cushion. Well, it might be something. We'll have to check with the Alston woman, see if they belong to her or anybody in her family. Yeah. What is this case, Joe? Kidnapping robbery. How many suspects? Two. One woman in the car? Yeah. Hurt her at all? Yeah, beat her up a little. Huh. Real he-man, huh? I sure wish I had more for you fellas to go on. 
Yeah, well, we don't have much, but at least we know something. What's that, Joe? When we reach these two, yeah. they won't give us any fight. <laughs> we went back to the office and called Gwen Alston. She told us the corneal lenses found in her car did not belong to her or to any member of her immediate family. She also gave us the serial number on her watch. We took the container over to the crime lab. Ray Pinker said because of the facets on the lenses, he thought it was a type made by the Stimson Company. The next morning, we drove out to their shop. We talked to George Dudley. We showed him the lenses. Yes, that's our lens. You can tell quite easily when you hold it up to the light. See those little facets? Mm -hmm. Where is it? Oh, yeah. Could you tell us who these were made for, Dudley? Mm -hmm. I can give you the name of the optician. Appreciate it if you could. I'll have to check our file. It shouldn't take too long. All right, sir. Ordinarily, we'd have checked lens power, diameter, radius curvature. Yes, sir. This is a special type lens. That's so? It's used to correct the condition of the eye known as keratoconus. What's that, sir? The conical cornea. Oh. oh. We don't make too many of them. Excuse me, I'll get the name of the optician for you. All right, fine. Pretty good deal, huh? Yeah. I know a fellow who wears them. Says he used to hate to get a haircut, but not anymore. All right. Yeah, with these glasses on his eyes, now he can get his haircut and still read the magazines. Oh. I found it for you. That's good. These were made for John L. Roberts. Just a minute, sir. I'd like to write that down. Okay, go ahead, please. John L. Roberts, mm -hmm. 439 Camden Drive, Beverly Hills. Thank you, sir. Got it? Yes, sir. This is the optician that sent in the prescription, huh? That's right. All right, fine. Thanks for your cooperation, Dudley. Not at all. I always get a kick out of helping you, fella. Yes, sir. A lot of steps to solve the crime, aren't they? Quite a few, yeah. Sure hope I've given you a little something. You yeah. have. A lot of steps. Yes, sir. You helped us make the first one. We drove out to Beverly Hills and we talked to John L. Roberts. He checked the prescription number against his files and gave us the name and address of a Robert Brierton as the man he had fitted with the corneal lenses. Frank and I went over to the house on Bedford Street, but there was nobody home. We found out from a neighbor that Brierton worked for a coin machine repair company on Pico Boulevard. We located the concern and the manager showed us where we could find the suspect. 10.13 a.m. Robert Bryden? Hmm? Is your name Robert Bryden? Yeah. Police officers. It's our identification. Joe Friday? That's right. It's Frank Smith. Mm -hmm. Hi, Howard. I'd like to ask you some questions. What about? Do you wear those glasses all the time? Do I what? The glasses you got on. Do you wear them for work? Yeah, most of the time. What's this about glasses? You ever wear any other kind? Yeah, why? What kind? Well, how many kinds are there? Why don't you tell us? I don't get this. What am I supposed to have done? You wear another kind of glasses? Isn't that what you said? Yeah. Uh, what kind? They're corneal lens sight. Where are they? I don't know. Home, I guess. You're not sure? Look, officers, I don't know what you're after, but if it's something that happened in the last 20 years, you've got the wrong guy. Well, if we have, then you've got nothing to worry about, have you? That's right, but a uh, mistaken identity can be embarrassing. I'd I just like to know what I'm supposed to have done. Suppose you tell us about the other glasses, huh? Your corneal lens? Yeah. Well, what do you want to know about them? Like we said before, we want to know where they are. Well, like I said, home. You sure? Yeah. How many pair do you have? One. Do you wear glasses all the time? Yeah. Can you see without them? Yeah, but not too good. Where were you night before last? At home. How about last night? Same. All night? Right. Can you prove it? Yeah, my wife will tell you that. You can call her on the phone. She'll tell you I didn't leave the house. All right. We'll go out there. You can call her just as well. We like to see your other glasses, too. All right. You mind telling me what this is all about? We're investigating the kidnapping and robbery. You think I had something to do with it? We're investigating. Okay, if that's how it is. I got nothing to hide. You want to go right now? That's right. My jacket's right here in the locker. Wait a minute. I'll get it for you. Yes, sir? Yeah, the brown suede with the net trim. We took Robert Brierton with us and we drove out to his home. On the way, he continued to deny any knowledge of the crime. Because the victim, Gwen Alston, had been unable to furnish us with much of a description of the suspects, it was difficult to determine whether or not Brierton was one of the men. He had dark hair. He was in his early 20s. The suede jacket he wore checked out. 11.07 a.m. Anna? Anna? Guess she isn't here. It's all right. We'll wait for her. Now, I've been trying to make up my mind whether I should be mad or not. I know you're only doing what you have to, so I guess there's no need to get overheated, but I'll say it again. You got the wrong guy. Well, if we're wrong, we'll admit it. Just hope this doesn't put me in bad down at work. No need for it, too, if you're innocent. I suppose so. 
You want to sit down? I don't know just when my wife will get back. You don't mind? We'd like to see your other glasses now. Oh, sure. I'll get them for you. Where are they? Well, I usually keep them on the bedroom dresser when I'm not using them. All right. We'll go with you, all right? Sure. Hope she made the bed. She's a pretty good housekeeper, but sometimes she gets a little sloppy about it. Yeah. I swear they were right here on the dresser. Yeah. I haven't had them too long. I switch off with these that I'm wearing. Did you wear them yesterday? Yeah, but then they should still be on the dresser. I don't know where they could be. Maybe we can help you. What do you mean? Who's back there? Anna? What are you doing wrong? Uh, honey, these are police officers. This is my wife. I do. How you doing, ma'am? What are they doing here? We'd like to talk to you, Miss Bryden. About what? Now, don't worry, dear. But what's it all about? I'd like to step out in the other room, please. It's all right, dear. I don't understand this. Listen to him. Can you tell us where your husband was Tuesday night? He was home with me. How about last night? He was here all evening. You sure? Yes, he came home from work and stayed in all evening. Oh, I see. What is it? Police business. You think Robert had something to do with it? Yes, we do. When did this happen? Last night. I told you he was home all evening. That may be true, but these corneal lenses were found in the victim's car. They belong to Robert? That's what his optician told us, yeah. It's all wrong. Well, the victim was beaten by a man who wore a jacket, brown suede with knit trim. That's the kind your husband owns, you know. But he wasn't out of the house, I tell you. I'm afraid Rob take him downtown. No, he didn't do it. I know it. I'm sorry, Miss Bryden. These are your husband's lenses. They were found in the victim's car. But he, he was with me all evening. Well, that may be, but we're going to have to hold him. No, he didn't do it. It was Gordon. Gordon who? I let him wear Robert's jacket last night. Well, who's Gordon? My brother. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. Mrs. Bryant went on to explain that she let her younger brother take the suede jacket the previous night. She also told us that the boy was living with them while he attended school. After questioning her further, we learned that Gordon Hedig had been in trouble with the police before. We called the office and asked Jack Crowley to check the name and description through R&I. We also asked that if he came up with a record, he'd have Harlan Stahl compare Hedig's fingerprints with the partials found in the victim's car. Frank and I got the address of the school that the boy was attending, and we drove over to see him. We waited in a small office while the school authorities located him. Well, Miss Austin was right about what she told us. What do you mean? Well, she said she couldn't give us a very accurate description. Yeah. She said the ages might be around 20 or so. Mm -hmm. Not many high school students look 20, not even seniors. Yeah, that's true, but according to what the Briartons told us, this could be the boy. Yeah, that's right. Come in. Come on in, son. Close the door. You Gordon Hetty? Yeah. Police officers, Hetty. Well, you want me to do standard attention? I told you once to come on in. Now, come on over here. Sure, but remember where you are. These ain't soundproof walls. I don't play tough with us, son. Sit down. You see, you orders always tell you guys what to do. Sit down and stand up. You're all the same. Never get off a guy. All right, back. just keep still. I'm sitting in school trying to learn something. you got to come around and jerk me out of class. Why don't you wait until General Assembly get the whole school in on it? I don't care what you do to a guy's reputation. That's what you think, is it? Yeah. Now, listen, son, we never heard of you before today, but we're finding out fast. The way we got it, you've gone way out of your way to make your own record, and you didn't do it in the classroom. Well, we've got a good reason to be here. If you're innocent, you won't have to worry about what anyone in this school thinks. You know, tell me, mister. We don't have to, son. If you're clean, it's like we never met you. But I'm going to put it right on the line for you. The way this thing shapes up right now, we think you already bought yourself another hunk of trouble. I figures. I'm made before I go in. That's where you're wrong, kid. Nobody's going to tag you with a bum beef. You give us the right answers, and like my partner said, we never met you. All right. What do you want from me? You can start by telling us what you did last night. I went to a show. Where? Downtown. What time? Oh, around seven, I guess. Who was with you? Nobody. I went by myself. What was the name of the theater? Uh, the Dorn. What'd you see? What pictures? Yeah. I don't remember right off. One was a western. It was about spies. You're all by yourself. I said so, didn't I? What time did you get out of the show? Around ten, I guess. What'd you do then? Went home. What kind of clothes did you have on last night? What do you mean? What were you wearing? Oh, jacket, sports shirt, usual stuff. What kind of jacket? Suede. 
Belong to you? No, my brother-in-law. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out to Washington and Normandy? To what? Washington and Normandy. I told you I was downtown. Say, what is this? You tell us. You were in that car, weren't you? What car? The one you beat the woman in. Oh, you're crazy. Who was with you? I told you I was alone. What more do you want? The name of the person that was with you. I don't know what you're trying to tag me with, but you're not going to make it this time. I told you I was at a show by myself. How do you think you can prove I wasn't? We found the lenses you lost from the jacket pocket. Boy, this gets wadded all the time. I was sitting in the show last night, that's it. In other words, you don't want to tell us about it, is that it? About the show. All right, Hedick, you played it your way. It's going to take us a little longer, that's all. Uh, same old story. Don't make any difference what I say. You know I got a record, so I'm guilty. Don't make any difference. Either way, I'm the pigeon. No, you're wrong. Not with us, Hedy. Oh, come on. I just didn't fall off the Christmas tree. There's only one way we want you. Yeah? If you're wrong. <laughs> We took Gordon Hedick to the city hall for further questioning. We called Gwen Alston and asked her to come down and see if she could identify the suspect. Harlan Stahl said the suspect's fingerprints matched the parcels found in the car, but there weren't enough points to build a case on. 2.47 p.m., Frank and I had the suspect brought to the squad room. Why don't you give up? I ain't going to cop out to something I didn't do. We don't expect you to, but we still want to know how a container with your brother-in-law's lenses could be found in the back seat of a victim's car. Now, they were in his jacket, and you wore that jacket. Isn't that right? Don't ask me. I was at the show. Yeah, so you said. Another thing, you guys better treat me pretty good while I'm in here. Yeah? Sure. I'm a kid. Don't forget Yeah, it. that's the way it reads in the books. For my money, that's as far as it goes. I told you once, we can put you in the backseat of that car. I get it. Robbery Friday. Right. Send her down, will you? Right away. Thank you. I'm going to tag the business office. I'll be right back. Okay, John. Miss Alston? Hello, Sergeant Friday. I got down as soon as I could. All right, fine. Uh, have you got the man here? Well, we'd like you to tell us. We'll go down the hall here. Uh, well, what do I have to do? You just look into this room. Tell me if you see the man that beat you up. Will I have to face him? No. We'll go around here. You can look through the door. Come on. All right. All right, here. Uh -huh. How do you see him? Well, what about it? Yes. There. We confronted Gordon Hedick with the fact that he'd been positively identified by the person he'd beaten and robbed. He still refused to admit any knowledge of the crime. We booked him on Section 700 Sub M, robbery. A check was made of the FI cards in an attempt to identify the person who'd been with Hedick the night before. We called Newton University and 77th Street Division. When we checked the Central, the clerk went through the files and found that the suspect had been stopped at 9th and Main Streets at 10 p.m. the previous night. Frank and I went over to the First Street Station. Is the FI card you want to charge him? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, here's what we're looking for. Yeah? Wasn't alone. A person by the name of John Burko was with him. Officer, make a card on him, too? Yeah, I got it here. What about the other guy? Thank you. John Burko, B E R K O, age 19, 506 Hold Avenue. Yeah. Something else in the back here that checks out. What's that? Notation the officer made. Yeah. Burko's right thumb was bandaged. We went back to the office and ran the name John Burko through R and I. We found a package form that showed several arrests as a juvenile and one as an adult for suspicion of ADW. Gwen Alston was shown his mug shot, and she identified him as the other suspect. We drove out to his address on Holt Street. It was a boarding house. The owner admitted us to his room. We waited. Four hours went by. 8.19 p.m. All right, Burko, hold it right there. What? Police officers, get your hands over your head. Come on, move. Sure. Open the door. Come on. Hands up on the door. Trying right, to hold it right there. What's the pitch? Come on, turn around. Get your hands behind your back. All right. Hey, take it easy with my thumb. I think I got blood poisoning. Yeah. Now, you want to tell me what this is about? A friend of yours sent us over to get you. Says you always work together on everything. It's kind of lonesome without you. Who are you talking about? Hedding. He sent you here. He copped up to you? All right, let's go. 
What did he say? You figured we're here. That fink. Big talk about how he'd never cop out to anything. Never admit nothing. Well, that's the way it is when you get mixed up with young squirt. All right, let's go. Lousy punk. Suppose you know how he beat up that woman. Yep. Should have heard him afterwards laughing about how he hit her. Should have figured he'd cop out if he got nailed. No guts. Got to beat up on women. No guts at all. Well, that's real funny, isn't it? What's that? We just talked to him. Yeah? He said the same things about you. The story you've just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On June 9th, trial was held in Department 97, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. A petition was filed on Gordon Hedig, alleging one count of robbery and kidnapping. He was declared unfit as a juvenile and ordered to be tried in Superior Court. Gordon Jerome Hedig and John Carlton Burkle were tried and convicted of robbery in the first degree, one count, and kidnapping for the purpose of robbery. Robbery in the first degree is punishable by imprisonment for a period of not less than five years. Kidnapping for the purpose of robbery with bodily harm is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for life without possibility of parole. Dragnet. The story of your police force in action is a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. George Lupo. His brother gave it to him after the funeral. The kind of music we play started out as a backroom exercise in a little swamp stop called Myrtle Grove. La Rocca took his Dixieland band to Risenweber's in New York. We got as far as Kansas City. It's no place to get off a train unless you're a sack of mail. 
Because around here, everybody works at the same job, staying alive. Half a buck buys a pair of socks, a spaghetti dinner, or a down payment on murder. The well, last night, everything turned sour about midnight. The town was down on its hands and knees trying to crawl through one of those Kansas City hot spells that blast by every third day. It was heat and headaches all the way. Our drummer, Nick, was dragging the beat, and I went bad 12 bars in on the Memphis Blues. So I figured we'd better cut the set short, so we started to fight our way through one chorus of Roses of Piggerty. That's when the kid came in and stood to the bandstand. He was tall enough to see over a quarter milk with a face the size of a minute and just about as young. <laughs> Let's get off for a while. Who's your friend, Pete? I don't know, but he must be tone deaf. Mr. Tilly! Tilly! Yeah, son? I heard you say you sound good. We've been better. What's on your mind? Father Cronin sent me to see you. Are you doing a little missionary work? Oh, well, no, sir, nothing like that. I'm an altar boy over there. Father calls me Little Jake. I sure got you working on the late shift. I've been trying to get a hold of you all day. Father wants a favor. Well, make it a small one. I'm all out of the big one. And he just wanted to know if you could come by St. Timothy's and see him. He said tomorrow morning right after the 9 o'clock. Okay. Tell him he keeps terrible hours. I'll be there. Thanks, Mr. Kelly. Hey, Kelly. Yeah, that's right. Tell the kid goodbye. He knows his way out. Should I go, Mr. Kelly? See you, kid. Yes, sir. Goodbye, Mr. Kelly. Yeah, goodbye, Kate. You got someplace private we'd like to talk. This is my office. Now, listen hard, bright eyes. There's enough gun in this coat to blow you right through the wall. I'll take your word for it. We come in here nice and you get funny, man. Now, you got someplace we can talk. I can't leave. I got to do a number. Do it. We'll be right here about ten feet from your stomach. Yeah. All right. Let's go. Well, you look sick, Pete. What's the matter? I feel fine. Who's sorry now? Everybody ready? Let's go. How many shall we do, please? If this works out, about ten minutes worth. Let's go. The alley will do. We need a favor, Kelly. Yeah, there's a run on them tonight. Give me the envelope, Dix. Yeah. You got an inside coat pocket, Kelly? Come on, come on. Need to throw up half the dice. Hold him, Dix. <laughs> Pull him up, Dix. Come on. How? Here's an envelope. It goes in your inside coat pocket and it stays there until 6 o'clock tomorrow night. You don't open it, you don't mess with it. What happens at 6 o'clock? You'll be the first to know. Well, I stood there in the alley and watched them walk away. Inside, Lupo was blowing up a storm. Something a lot pain for a seven-piece band and only having six. Well, it wasn't worth trying to get back on the stand. I got a cab and went up to my room. I tried to get to sleep. It was no good. I got up. I was sick to my stomach. After that, I went to sleep. The next morning, I made a pass at some breakfast and tried to look through the sports page. Harry Heilman got four for five against the Red Sox, but that's all I read. That envelope had me. 
People have been taken out in alleys before, and they've been worked over. Usually they get something away from them, not to give it to them. No matter how I tried to put it together, it wouldn't come out. Thin or fat, it wouldn't slice. I had the envelope, and I had to wait till six o'clock. Well, I gave up on the coffee, and I started over to see Father Cronin. It was a little after 9.30 when I started up the steps of St. Timothy's. I figured mass was almost over, so I hung around in the vestibule for a couple of minutes, trying to look like a part-time bell ringer. Hi, Mr. Kelly. Hello, Jake. Father's back in the sacristy, Mr. Kelly. He said for me to show you the way. They move it? No, sir. All right, Jake. Show me the way. This way, Mr. Kelly. Down this aisle. Well, I guess I was too busy trying to act like I knew my way around to pay much attention to a fat, chunky little guy wearing a brown Borsalino hat. He stood up in a back pew a couple of aisles over. The church was empty except for the three of us. Little Jake found out about it just before I did. Mr. Kelly, that man back there. All right, mister. I'll take that envelope. Jake, get out. Mr. Kelly, look out. Look out. Well, in Kansas City, you learn early to look for trouble. Any place, any time. But this is the first time it caught up with me in the middle of a church. The last three shots were a waste of money. Jake went down like young wheat in a hailstorm. When I grabbed for him, I hit my head in the base of a marble pillar. I lost the edge right there. By the time I hit the street, he was gone. I guess I covered every alley and street in the neighborhood. But it was like trying to wash a pail of dirty water. I don't know how much later it was when I stopped for a minute in an empty doorway and tried to remember what I was chasing. Well, a siren was crying off somewhere in the distance and I started back for the church. The coroner's wagon was just pulling away as I got there. I didn't see Father Cronin around, so I went back to the rectory and rang the bell. He came to the door in his shirt sleeve. He stood there for a minute just looking at me. And then he motioned me inside. In here. Sit down. The kid, Father. Little Jake. He's dead. You want to blow by blow? Yeah, I know, Father. I was there. Sure you were there. You're always there. I should have known better than to call you. I should have known it meant trouble. Oh, wait a minute, Father. This wasn't my party. I called you here today to ask you a favor, Pete. Yeah, I know. You don't know. It's too late now. We were going to have an altar boy picnic tomorrow at Washington Park. I wanted you to play a little music for us. We won't be going now, Pete. we got a funeral instead. Yeah. What do you want me to say? Don't say anything, Pete. If you've got any private fights, that's your business. But don't bring your beef into the church. I never saw the guy before, Father. Don't kid me. He didn't come in here to shoot little Jake. Now, look, I know this is hard to understand. You bet it's hard to understand. We've been over it before, but you ran with the same pack. You hung on to the same friends. You had it all figured out. Well, you figured this one, Pete. There's a nine-year-old boy on his way to the morgue. He took a gangster's bullet that you earned. Now you go ahead. Figure it. I, I got this envelope. I don't want an explanation. Take your excuses and peddle them where you need them. To the bootleggers and the gunmen. Take them to your crowd. This envelope, Father. They shoved it in my pocket. I was out in the alley behind the club. Two guys. They worked me over. I didn't think they'd try anything like this. Neither did little Jake. All right, Father. I told you I was sorry. Go on home. Why don't you stop cutting at me and say a prayer for that kid? I would, but I'm too busy praying for people like you. How do you explain away a dead kid lying in front of an altar rail? All I could offer was a two-cent envelope in my coat pocket in a wild night in an alley. I started to walk back to my room. I tried to paste up some kind of an answer, but I got nothing. I was halfway home when the last breeze left town and went someplace to cool off. My clothes were soaking wet, and I decided to take a cab the rest of the way. I reached in my pocket, and all I had was 23 cents, so I kept walking. Sunday morning's the same in any town. Empty streets and everybody home trading the comic section and living off a of Saturday night. You could live here all your life, and on Sunday morning you just got in town. It was about noon when I got to my hotel. I went up to the second floor and unlocked my door. They were sitting on the bed. Their coats were off, and they'd hung them on the back of a chair. The same two boys who'd given me the envelope last night. Real hot room here, Kelly. You want to move off this court? Yeah, next time I'll get twin beds. Is everything all right with that envelope? It made a murder, mister. You take it. Put it back in your pocket. Now, get this, both of you. There's a lot of something wrong here. I've had my turn. You find yourself another fall guy. There's a lot of inside coat pockets in this town. Look for a new one. We like yours, and that's where it's going to stay. Now, you don't listen good. Me and Dex put it out last night, and you didn't pick up on it. We got you on board, and we'll tell you when to get off. Six o'clock, boy. How long do you think this jag will last? Look, I'm cashing in. I've had enough. What were you doing this morning? Trying to pray your way out? A priest wanted a favor. I got it, Lon. Yeah. Yeah, he's in. No, he's busy. From two five. Sure, come on up. Funny. He went for it, huh? 
On his way up. We're going to stay a while, Kelly. Well, there's only three chairs. I'll make it easy for you. Very important, mister. No, he's your friend. I'm checking out. <coughs> First time you've been right. Well, it happened so fast I didn't even see his arm move. My knees buckled and I pitched forward. I don't know how long I laid there, but when I opened my eyes, the afternoon sun was almost gone. What was left of it was bleeding through a rip in the blind. Well, I could hear somebody breathing hard like a fat man on a hot day, and when I rolled over, I saw him. A tough prohibition agent by the name of Cage. The weather didn't make any difference to Cage. He always looked that way. His collar was wilted, and it looked like Arrow's first try. His necktie was pulled down, and the knot was twisted. The heat had worked him over so that the front of his shirt was splotchy and damp. Reminded you of a first grader's map of the world. He was sitting in a chair with his arms draped over the back and his head resting on his hands. He was smoking a Milo Violet, but it didn't help that much. His mouth was wound around a toothy grin, and he looked like a mountain lion who'd just eaten her young. You can get up now, Keller. You made your point. Yeah, sure. How long you been here? Long enough to fill out your book and slip. You're going to jail, mister. What for? Sleeping on the floor? For the dead guy on the bed. Who is he? I don't know. How'd he get there? You put him there after you shot him. I get you. Look, prohibition's your racket. Dead bodies are out of your line. Not when I find him in your room. Now let's go downtown. We'll both tell homicide. We'll find the details later. Gage, you couldn't find yourself in a mirror. I didn't have anything to do with this, and you know it. I've been out for the last three hours. This happened after they slugged Save me. it for the jury. All I know is I got a phone tip to check room 205. I come up here and I find you in a dead guy. That's all I need. You can dress it up fancy and make it look cute, but it still comes out. There's enough liquor in this town to float it away, and you're wasting your time with a killing that's none of your business. You're my business, big shot. Somebody put two pounds of lead in Benny's chest, and you're my pick. Benny who? Benny Davis. He worked for Mike Quinlan. You look pale. Yeah, I'm just beginning to feel a squeeze. Mike Quinlan on one side, and those two trigger men that you let walk out of here on the other. You got it, and I'll be turning a handle. Now, before you start worrying about your picture in the paper, you better turn up the two guys that were here with me. That part of the same dream? They gave me an envelope to hold for him. The price on it's going up for the minute. A nine-year-old kid died for it, and this guy here on the bed. That's a good story. Do you write him down or just make him up? Look, you got nothing on me, and I haven't got much time. I'm leaving you. That's all right. I called downtown. The minute you hit the street, they'll pick you up. In the meantime, you better come up with more than you got. They don't hang you in this state on a hunch. I'm gonna check this room over. I'll find all we need. You couldn't find your head with both. Hands. Goodbye, Cage. All right, you got till midnight, big shot, and then I'll be around. Yeah. I'll have it all set up. All we'll need is time to run the extra. Well, I could have used a cold shower, but with Cage there, I didn't have the room to dry off. I went down the hall and headed down the back stairs. I figured even if Cage was right about calling downtown, I might have an edge if I moved fast enough. The sun was on the downgrade, but it didn't make any difference. He'd done a good job all day, and the heat was boiling up out of the ground. Well, if I was going to come out at all, I had to have some help. So I started to look for the only honest guy I know, an ex-bootlegger by the name of Barney Ricketts. The only bootlegger in the country that went broke in 1922. He drank himself out of business. I phoned eight different places and tried four. Nobody'd seen him. I was about ready to give up when I finally found him sitting in the middle of a bourbon fog in a little Spanish joint somewhere on the edge of the East Bottoms. He was sitting at a back table trying his best to make time with a plaster bust of Queen Isabella. <laughs> ah, Peachy, my boy, you're just in time. I'm not quite certain, but I think the young lady here has a friend. i got to talk to you, Barney. If you're any good at all with Spanish, now is the time. I was positive she'd loosen up on this second bottle of wine, but no, she's utterly uncharitable, and I think she's a picture of a perfect boy. Yeah, all right, Barney. And to a member of the old Castilian school, there can be no excuse for the conduct she's exhibiting. Yeah. Why, do you know I was even good enough to buy her three rounds of Portuguese brandy? Imported, mind you. But what do I get for my pains? Not even a civil thank you. All right, listen, I mean, I've been Barney. sitting here in the most gentlemanly fashion, sipping this delicate nectar and trying vainly to keep the party going. But does she help? No! I've talked to her about politics, medicine, literature, Keith, Byron, Shelley, Faith Baldwin. I've even talked about the weather. Barney, she's a statue. Oh, a simple oversight, Pete. It could happen to anyone. Now, look, I'm in trouble. Of course you're in trouble. You'll always be in trouble because you're a child of adversity, a son of scorn. The fate spit in your eye and you try to retaliate, but the wind's always blowing in the wrong direction. You're a lost leaf in the mortal storm, Petey. You're a pebble shaking a tiny fist at the mountain. You'd like to fight for some strange, fantastic cause, wouldn't you? But you can't find anybody your size. Men are too small and the gods are too big. Petey, you're lost. Are you all through now? Yes. What kind of trouble? A pair of bum murder wraps. Somebody slugged me in my room and I woke up with a dead guy. Oh, dubious honor. You mentioned two murders. One of them was an altar boy over at St. Timothy's. The other guy worked for Mike Quinlan. The same Quinlan that controls most of the Canadian import here in town? Yeah, that's him. Oh, time's short. Let's finish the brandy. 
two guys started all this at the club last night. Names are Ludd and Dex. Mean anything to you? This law sound better with more brandy. Uh, you picked two of Quinlan's first string. Ludd Sandell and Dex Porter, both killers. Look, they gave me an envelope to hang on to. Now, nose around. See if you can find out what it all means. The dead guy up in my room, his name's Benny Davis. See if you can find out where he fits in, will you? It'd be a lot simpler if you just joined Quinlan's gang. Benny Davis holds a card in the same organization. Well, how about Ludd and Dex? Any bad blood between them and If Davis? there is, it doesn't show. They're closer than unborn peas. You sure about that, Barney? Police blood, it can't be that wrong. Benny's sister will tell you the same thing. Well, where do I find her? Chelsea Apartments. Beautiful girl, Petey. When you're my age, she'll disturb your memories. All right, now get going, will you? See how close you can get to Quinlan's headquarters. Find out what you can about Ludd and Dex and Benny Davis. Maybe Quinlan's got him on a special job or something. Find out what it is, will you? You find me in a temporary economic slump, Petey. I'll need car fare. Yeah, well, that makes two of us. I'm broke. You'll have to do it on foot. Oh, well, I have friends here. My credit's unlimited. Well, hurry up, will you, Barney? One moment. Alfonso, would you loan me a dollar and a half? Come on, let's go. He's only bluffing. He won't shoot. <laughs> Well, Barney headed down toward Bale Street for Mike Quinlan's place, and I started cross town for the north end in the Chelsea apartments. I couldn't begin to work it out. If Dex and Ludd were such good friends with Benny Davis, why did they kill him? And if they didn't do it, who planted his body in my room and why? Well, I was running way late, and there wasn't much time to catch up. I finally found the Chelsea apartments on the corner of Stocker and Bale, with an old three-story wooden frame. I checked the mailbox, and Louise Davis was down for apartment 17. Well, inside, the hallway was dark, and a couple of gas jets were smoking up the ceiling. There was a potted palm by the foot of the stairs, and it looked like it was growing out of old gum wrappers and cigar butts. Apartment 17 was at the rear of the first floor. She answered the door, and you could tell right away Barney was right. She was pretty, and she had enough smile to last you for years. Yes? You Louise Davis? That's right. I can do better for you. You're Pete Kelly. I've heard you play. Yeah, well, so far you're batting a thousand. Can I come in? Yeah, sure. You didn't bring your band, so it must be a social call. I'll make this short. It's about Benny. What about him? That's what I want to know. He's got a couple of friends I got to know about him. Then he isn't that popular. You mean Ludd and Dex? They'll do. They got trouble and they're cutting me in. What kind of trouble? No, I'm not sure. That's why I came to you. I can't help you. They never tell me what they're doing. Well, they gave me an envelope. They told me to hold it till 6 o'clock tonight. You haven't got any problem. You'll know in an hour. Yeah, well, maybe I'm tired. I want to know now. I'll take any leads you got. They found out I told you this. They might not like it. They got some kind of a beef with Quinlan. Does Mike know about it? I wouldn't know. I just heard him talking one night. They're not happy with the money Quinlan gives them. They got any plans? I don't think we've got to talk about this. Let me get you a drink, huh? Now, look, this is the last trip around for me, lady. i got to have everything you know. You said something about an envelope, didn't you? That's right. You got it? Right here. If you open it, you'll understand everything. Well, they gave it to me sealed. They want it back the same way. You want to be around to give it back, you'd better open it. You've got a guarantee, Andy. All I know is the three of them are working on something big. I don't know what it is, but I heard some talk about an envelope. It's your choice. You asked for a lead and you got it. Yeah. Well, hold hands when they cut me down. You got a letter open? Pete, look out! Well, it all happened faster than a Mexican divorce. Louise Davis was dead before the echo left the room. Well, I got to the window, but whoever did the shooting was gone. I grabbed the envelope, and on my way out, I took another look at her. There wasn't anything left but the smile. I cut through a couple of back lots and down an alley. I stopped in the doorway and opened the envelope. Inside was a handful of typewritten sheets. Looked like a lot of headache for five pieces of paper. And then the bell rang. Two of them were consignment slips for 8,000 gallons of high-grade Canadian whiskey. The other three slips were detailed breakdowns for a convoy of trucks. They showed special truck routes over the Canadian border into the States to miss the hijackers and the prohibition agents. They showed a day-by-day schedule for each truck on its trip down from the border. Well, it's not too tough to hijack a load of booze, but when you got it laid out right down to the time, the place, and how many bottles, it's like money in the bank. So I knew right then why the envelope meant so much to Ludden Dex. What I couldn't understand was where they got it. Why they gave it to me to hang on to. Well, maybe they were working for Quinlan, but why didn't he have the papers, and why weren't they in his safe? Mike had a big one. Well, the questions were still piling up. It was an outside chance, but I couldn't stand still, so I crossed over to the Kansas side and headed down Boulder Road to Fat Annie's place. Maggie Jackson did two things good. She sang the blues better than the guy who wrote them, and she could pick up an idle rumor at three miles. Hi, Pete. Maggie, what do you know? I knew you'd be here tonight. You always come in together. Trouble and Pete Kelly. Yeah, I know. I never come around except when I need something. As long as I have it to give, you got it. It's Mike Quinlan that's tying in. Well, that's a part of it. I'm in it up to my ears. You got an envelope, I heard. Yeah. Mike Quinlan and some of his boys have been here about an hour ago. 
They tore the paper off the walls looking for you and Dex and Ludd. Dex and Ludd? Mike wants all three of you. Yeah? Anything else? No. Bonnie Ricketts called for you. Did he leave a number? He's still waiting on the phone. I took the call. He said you'd end up here, so he just hung on. Well, I'll get it right now. Yeah, the boss is kind of mad. The phone's been tied up for two hours. All right, thanks, Maggie. Sure, and good luck, Pete. Hello, Bonnie. Ah, uh, there you are, Pete. That'll be a dollar twenty-five for another three minutes. Yes, all right, operator. Alfonso, five more quarters, please. No, no, the quarters. Just a minute, Petey. Alfonso doesn't know the quarters from the house. Yeah, well, hurry up. What's going on, Bonnie? Where are you? Fort Madison, Iowa. I'm troubleshooting for you, Pete. Well, what'd you find out? It's a double cross. Mike Quinlan's involved in one of the biggest deals of his career, and Benny Davis, along with Dex and Blood, stole the consignment papers. Yeah, I know. That's what's in the envelope. You better get them back to Quinlan. I understand he's been tearing up the town for them. Well, what do I do about Dex and Blood? See you when you get back. It's been a gay, mad world, Petey. We drove 60 miles an hour all the way up here. Yeah? Alfonso's drunk. He thinks the phone's a slot machine. He's waiting for the payoff. Well, as soon as I hung up the phone, everything fell into place. I had one big worry, to get back to the club and unload those papers before Quinlan caught up with me. Well, almost everything made sense now, except the killing of Louise Davis, Benny's sister. It was easy to see why they dropped Benny along the way, but why his sister? How did she tie in? Well, on the way back to town, I mulled over a couple of possibilities, and I figured maybe I came up with the answer. I started back for town, and it was rough all the way. I kept thinking any minute I'd bump into Mike Quillen, and I couldn't be sure that I'd lost Dex and Ludd. It was almost dark by the time I got back to the club. The band was waiting around for the Sunday rehearsal. We ran through one number, and then things got cloudy. Now, Kelly. You're early, Dex. Close enough. No, not for me. You said six o'clock. Your horn's no match for this gun. Give me the envelope. Six o'clock, Dex. All right. Let's try someday, sweetheart. Hand me that plunger, will you, Red? I'll give you the pickup. Six o'clock, Lud. 
Here's your envelope. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Hello, Pete. Hi, Father. Just going to stop by. I heard the gunshots and knew you'd be around. Well, let me tell you again, Father. I'm sorry about Jake. I don't know what else to say. I'm just sorry. I believe you. We'll have the funeral for little Jake tomorrow. Maybe you want to stop by. Yeah. Some things never figure. A nine-year-old kid shot down. No reason for it. None in the world. Nine-year-old kid. It's done, Pete. Don't waste your pity on little Jake. He's got a big lead on both of us. I don't get you, Father. You and I should die as good as a nine-year-old. Music by Dick Cathcart. Scoring by Matty Matlock. The music of Pete Kelly's Big Seven consists of Dick Cathcart on cornet, Matty Matlock on clarinet, Nick Fatoul on drums, Ray Sherman on piano, George Van Epps on guitar, Judd Donat on bass, Mo Schneider on trombone. The songs of Maggie Jackson were written by Arthur Hamilton. Pete Kelly's Blues is a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. to hear is true. Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to burglary division. You get a call that an important piece of religious art has been stolen from the oldest church in Los Angeles. There's no lead to its whereabouts. Your job? Find it. documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step-by-step step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Wednesday, December 24th. It was cold in Los Angeles. We were working a day watch out of burglary division. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Bernard. My name's Friday. I'd gone across the street to buy stamps for some Christmas cards I was sending out. It was 9.15 a.m. when I got back to room 45. Burglary. I sat down at a table in the squad room and I started to address the cards when Frank walked in carrying a stack of Christmas boxes. Hi, Joe. All right. Christmas cards, huh? A little late, aren't you? Well, I wasn't going to send them out Monday, but we had that steak out. You ought to get married, Joe. Yeah? It's the only system. Faye does all that stuff for me. 
Laundry, mails, cards. Only system. Might help. You brought in your present. Want to open it now? No, I'll wait. I always open a couple of days before. Why? Well, puts you in the spirit ahead of time. I opened Phil's this morning. Who's he? Faye's brother in Denver. Gave me a magazine. One of those funny ones. What do you mean, a comic book? No. One of those funny ones, you know. No, I don't, Frank. Well, some of the pages have holes in them. You look through and there's a picture on the next page. Oh, yeah, I've seen those on the newsstand. They have cloth pasted in. Cloth? In the ads. If you want to buy a suit, they have a sample right there. You mean you can feel it? Reach right out and feel it. It was one for $200. A suit? Sure. Cloth comes from Scotland. What's it made out of, solid gold? No, they got a special kind of goat over there. It's real smooth. Not a goat, Frank. A sheep. Well, it's a special kind of sheep, then, because the suit costs $200. You gonna get one? I told Faye. She said, wear the sample. Anything doing? Fanning and Pryor were in on that market holdup. They come up with anything? Pound of air. Nothing else. I hope it stays quiet. I got more shopping to do. I finished. What'd you get in? Stationary set. Some paper and envelopes. Leather binding. Joe, you'll never learn. Well, what's the matter? No woman wants a stationary set. Get her something personal. Well, it's got her initials on it. No, no. You want something more sentimental. Romantic. What'd you get Faye? It's different in her case. What'd you get Faye? Sewing machine. That's romantic. Well, there's no way. Why don't you buy her a catcher's mitt? Gregory Friday. Yes, that's right. You have the right department. All right, Father, we'll be right down. No, you can tell us about it there. Goodbye. The old mission church, they've had a theft. Collection money? Statue of the child Jesus. Frank and I checked out of the office and rode over to the church at the corner of Sunset Boulevard in Maine. The old mission plaza church, founded 1781. The year Los Angeles became a Pueblo. The outside was typical early Spanish design, complete with mission arches. It was made of adobe and painted white. They called it the Queen of the Angels. The Padres from down in Mexico built it. The devout Mexicans in town still attended services there. 10.05 a.m. Frank and I crossed through the courtyard. It used to be the old stable, but the Spanish priest changed all that when it became a mission. Stonemasons paved the stable floor and made it a courtyard. They planted grapevines, trees, and flowers. A young priest crossed the courtyard to meet us. He'd been sitting on a stone bench reading his morning prayers, as priests had done here for 172 years. We asked for Father Xavier Rojas, who communicated with us. We were told he was inside. We entered a side door. The church seemed to glow with the hundreds of votive candles flickering on both sides of the altar and at the shrines throughout the church. It was empty except for a few people praying. Surrounding the main altar were several old oil paintings and gold frames. The air was heavy with the scent of Advent flowers. We found Father Rojas up near the sanctuary, looking at the nativity scene. He told us about the crib. It was a $70 duplication of the scene at Bethlehem. The parishioners had taken up a collection for it 31 years ago. It was put up every year on December 22nd and taken down after the holy season. It was beautiful, except that one of the shepherds had lost an arm, the sheep was old and cracked, and the infant Jesus was missing. Father Rojas led us back into the sacristy. I'm sorry to bother you, man. All right, Father. Especially now, the holiday season. We cash our checks, Father. You want to tell us what happened? Or what you think happened? I discovered the statue was missing right after the six o'clock mass. You say the six? Yes. I started over to the rectory and stopped by the crib. Was the statue there before mass? I don't know. But it was there last night. How late is the church open? All night. You leave it wide open so any thief can walk in? Particularly thieves, Sergeant. You say it was there last night, Father. How late? Ten or eleven o'clock. We had confessions. No one saw it after that? One of the altar boys, he says it may have been there. He thinks it was. Did he see it? He's not sure. What's his name? Pardon me. Here's the schedule. You'll find the names for every mass there. Was there a big crowd at the six o'clock mass, Father? Not too many. Seven's the big one. People on their way to work. Did anyone stay after mass, did you notice? Not especially. I came back here, took off the vestments. I suppose it was ten or fifteen minutes before I went back in the church. It was empty then? No, people were coming in for the seven o'clock. Are these the older boys, James Cornine and Joseph Heffernan? That's right. Joe's the one who mentioned it might have been there. Did you check with the other priests, Father? Before I called you. None of them knows anything about it. Just for a check on the pawn shops, how much is the statue worth? In money? Well, that's the point in pawn shops, Father. Only a few dollars. We could get a new one, but it wouldn't be the same. 
We've had children in the parish. They've grown up and married. It's the only Jesus they know. We understand. And we've had children who died. It was the only Jesus they knew. So many of the people who come here are simple people. They wouldn't understand, Sergeant. It would be like changing the evening star. We'll do our best, Father. That's why it would mean so much to have it back for the first mass on Christmas. It's not very long, Father. Less than 24 hours. If anything turns up here, you know where to get in touch with us. Yes. It's sad, isn't it? How's that? In so short a time, men learn to steal. Yes, but consider us, Father. Us? If some of them didn't, you and I'd be out of work. 10.50 a.m. We notified pawn shop detail. Frank and I checked out the two altar boys. The first one, James Cornine, said he knew nothing about the missing statue. The second one, Joseph Heffernan, was not at home. His father said he had a part-time job, but he'd have him get in touch with us right after lunch. By 11.30 a.m., we'd run out of book procedure. We had a man to find. Our only clue? He'd been to church. 11.33 a.m. We checked the phone books for the names of religious stores in the area. Two of them were closed. We tried the third. When we got there, the only person in the store was an elderly man sitting by a table. In front of him was a large, beautifully carved chess set. We're police officers. My name's Friday. This is my partner, Frank Smith. Great to see you. Caught me in the middle of a big chess match. Where's your partner? Up in San Jose. We've been playing for years. Same match? No, just two or three months on this one. What I meant was we've been playing different matches for years. I see. You know, we do it through the mail. I send him a move, he sends me one. Must keep you on your toes. Except during the holidays, the mail gets all fiddled up. That's no good. Guess not. Slows things down, that's no good. I like to catch him off guard. You Mr. Flavin? How do you know? We never met. Your name's on the window out front. Mr. Flavin, we checked the other two religious stores in this neighborhood. They're closed. It's the best one anyway. Fifty percent European items. We're checking the stores around the Mission Church. For what? Statue of the Child Jesus. Do you have one we could look at? Sure. No, sir, a larger one. You don't want a larger one, unless it's for the church. That's why you want a larger one. Could we see it, please? It's not my due to butt in. But unless you live in a big place, this will make your living room all a kilter. Yes, sir. Do most of the people who go to the mission church trade here? Good many of them, especially the kids. Why kids? More religious. Check on yourself. See if kids aren't more religious than you. Might be so. That's what's wrong with the world. Oh, I don't mean you're wrong with it. Everybody. Yes, sir. What if we could stick to the point, Mr. Flavin? Sure. A lot of people from the mission church come in here. Do people ever come in and sell back a religious article? Like a prayer book or rosaries? Yes, sir. Second hand, you mean? Yes, sir. Not since I've ever been around. It's silly. Why? People don't have religious articles so they can get rid of them. They have them so they can have them. But if a man had a statue and wanted to sell it, he'd come to a place like this. Sure, but he wouldn't want to sell it. He would if it was stolen. No, sir. If a man was to steal a statue, he'd be crazy or something like that. The only place he'd want to go is where crazy people are. You may be right, Mr. Flynn. I don't know what you fellas are looking for, but if it's somebody who stole a statue, he's crazy and you won't find him. You won't find him as long as you live, or in a million years. That should cover it. We checked religious stores out as far as Van Ness. We asked the same questions. The owners gave us the same answers, but none of them were as encouraging as Mr. Flavin. Frank and I had lunch and reported back to the office. It was 1.30 p.m. when we started into the squad room. The captain was just coming out. I just checked for you in our lunchroom. We've been out on that theft at the mission. Make it some action on the Patterson case. They locate him? I think he's on the bus from Sacramento. Well, that means the Bakersfield police. We'll wait and see. One of you fellow sergeants, Freddy? He is. I'm Drew Heffernan. My father said you wanted to see me. Well, sit down, son. You didn't have to come in. A phone call would have worked. My father said to get on over. He says that any kid that uses phones is lazy. We want to ask you about this morning. You serve 6 o'clock mass? Yes, sir. I'm senior boy. Do I get the 6th? You're senior and you take the early trick? Yes, sir. That way, if you receive communion, you get to have breakfast sooner. Father Rojas says you think the statue was there before mass. I didn't look. But I have a feeling it was there. A feeling? You know, how you have a feeling about something, but you're not sure. Did you stay around long after Mass? I put out the candles and hung up my surplus. How long would that take? About five minutes, maybe. Did any of the people at Mass stay on? Some moms do. 
Especially ladies. Oh? Maybe they don't finish in time. Or else they start new prayers. I don't know. So when you left, there were still some women there? No, sir. That was at first. After I went back to the sacristy, there was only this one man. What man? He comes at six o'clock all the time. Do you know his name? No, sir. But he works down in Olive. You know, old paint shop. Where the paint signs. Could you describe him? Sort of medium. He was wearing a suit that didn't match. Didn't match? You know, different pants than coat. How about his age? Oh, he's pretty old. Take a guess. About 40, maybe. There's nothing particular about him. Then why'd you notice him? I've seen him before. In the bundle, I guess. The bundle? Out in front. I saw him when he was coming out. He had this bundle. And he almost dropped it. How large a bundle? It's hard to say. Come on, son. Was it large or small, the size of the statue? Not that big. Yes, sir. located the sign shop. The suspect didn't work there anymore, but we discovered his name was Claude Stroop. We found out where he lived. 2.25 p.m. We arrived there. It was a hotel for men, mostly old men, mostly down and outers. It was called the Golden Dream. Police officers, we're looking for Claude Stroop. Hope Claude didn't get in any trouble. So do we. Is he in? No. He's got room 307. You can check if you like. We'll take your word. Were you on this morning? Hmm? Yeah, the early shift. Well, we don't have shifts. My uncle owns the place. I'm the shift. Did Stroop spend last night here? Came in about 11. When did he leave this morning? Around 6, maybe before. Did he come back after? 8 o'clock or so. Then left. Supposed to be back at 10. Then pulls this trick. What trick? Our program. He knows the other fellas need him. Program? They're here at the hotel. Every Christmas we have a program. Put up a tree and sing. They're mostly old fellas. Singing like that makes them remember back when they were kids. Then Jimmy Finn comes on. Jimmy Finn? He shares number 409. His family once had a lot of money, so he tells the fellas about it. Stories about Christmas. How they had this big log, and his grandfather used to start it up. And after dinner, everybody turned over his plate, and there underneath was a $20 gold piece. Brand new one. When Stroop came in this morning, did he have a bundle? I didn't see him come in. You said you saw him. I saw him go out after, but not come in. When was that? Eight. If you want to look for a bundle, I could give you his key. We don't have a warrant. It's all right. I know about police. It's all right with me. It's not with us. I didn't mean that. I just meant it was all right with me. King Wenceslas looked out on the feast of steam and when the They were three old men. We couldn't tell how much better they would have been with Stroop singing the fourth part, but somehow you didn't care. This was Christmas at the Golden Dream, and it sounded fine. Though the frost was cruel, when the poor man came in sight, carrying winter fuel. This is the last rehearsal. I got most of the songs down pat. Sounds pretty good. Yeah, that's why it's a shame Claude isn't here. He's tenor, and they need him to make it sound just right. Does Stroop have a job? No, sir. He used to have jobs. Not much lately, though. Did he say where he was going? No, he should have. The fellas need him. When he comes in, would he call us? Sure, and uh, not say anything to him. That's right. I hope it's nothing serious for Claude. The fellas' troubles ought to be over. Troubles? Way back. It wouldn't count. Tell us anyway. Well, I don't know much about it. As much as you know. Now, come on. Well, was something back where he used to live. He robbed somebody or something. What else? That's all. It was a long time ago, way far back. But he forgot it all, the robbing and everything. No, not quite. Hmm? He remembered it this morning. God rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. For Jesus Christ our Savior was born upon this day. Back to the office and ran Stroop's name through R and I. If he'd been booked anywhere, we had no record of it, at least not under that name. 4.15 p.m. Pawn shop detail reported back. No object resembling the statue of the child Jesus had been turned in. 4.18 p.m. I hung up the phone. Patterson's on that Sacramento bus. I thought Baker still had it. They were supposed to confirm they did. Hop over the station. Well, what about Fanning and Pryor? Just still out. Well, they'll be back soon. When's the bus arrive? Six o'clock. Well, there's plenty of time for him to make it. There's more time for you. We're still in that theft. Can it wait? No. What is it? Ten, fifteen dollar statue? When's the price determine a case? I realize it's a church statue, but that doesn't give it priority. It's important to them, Captain. Joe and I promised to get it back. What do you got on it? Nothing much. 
And why are you so big hearted? Burglary Friday. When? No. Don't say anything. No. Right. Claude Stroop, he just walked into the hotel. He's our suspect. Nobody's late to him? No. You'll keep. You can run him down tomorrow. It'll be too late then. They need it for the first mass in the morning, Skipper. It's kind of a big thing for them. I'm sorry. I can't juggle details around so you get a statue back. If this time later on, we'll do our best. Yes, sir. You better get over to the station. Yes, sir. Will you call Father Rojas over at the mission? Why? Tell him we're too busy to work on that statue. But well, we'll do it later. Tomorrow or when we get a chance. Why can't you call him? Well, we better get over to the station. If Patterson's on that bus, we don't want to miss him. All right, I'll call him. Righty. Yeah. I can send Fanning in priority. Might as well stay on that other thing. Whatever you say, Captain. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. We arrived at the Golden Dream Hotel. The desk clerk was right. Claude Stroop looked like a man who had his troubles at bargain rates. Your name Claude Stroop? Yes, sir. Police officers, we'd like to talk to you. I didn't do anything against the law. Honest, I didn't do anything against it. You haven't been accused. I want to take you downtown. We'd like to talk to you. No, sir, I'm not going. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going to talk to anybody. You're half wrong already. Fifteen p.m. We returned Stroop for interrogation. He kept his word. He refused to talk. 6.05 p.m. Frank called Faye, told her he'd be a little late. Stroop didn't move for a whole hour. He sat and stared, but he didn't talk. 6.40 p.m. We got a final report from pawn shop detail. The shops were closed. There was no statue. Stroop still hadn't talked. Don't you ever want to go home, Stroop? If I was to talk, he wouldn't let me go. Depends on what you'd say. I'd say it wrong, and I wouldn't get home. You won't this way either. I'd like to go. You can bet on that. This is the seventh year we had the program, and I never missed a one. Not a single one. Why don't you tell us what happens, Drew? How would I know you'd let me go? You wouldn't. I might as well anyway. All right, what happened from mass on? Well, there was mass. I came out and started down toward the hotel. Back up. I left my stuff at the hotel, and then I picked up George's car. I didn't steal it. He said I could have it any time I wanted. Only this time I didn't ask him. I took it and started out. Well, I should have asked, but I just didn't. I went over to Grand Avenue for the Christmas bulbs where this fellow sells in second hand. It was coming out of the lot, but I did. Yeah. The bumper must have caught the other car. Didn't leave too big a dent, but there was this long scratch. I got out and tried to wipe it off with my handkerchief. You know, spit on it like. Only it didn't do no good. I didn't think anybody saw. I don't know how you fellas found out about it. I'll check auto records. Right. Stroop, we didn't bring you down here to talk about that. You didn't? No. There's a statue missing from the church. A statue of the child Jesus. You mean I took it? You took a bundle out of church. Yes, sir. That was my other pants for the program tonight. I had a place sewed up and there was a button on it. You can check. But I wouldn't take a statue. I don't think you would either. He's clear at auto records. One hope. For the program? You mean it's all right? Good night, Stroop. Good night. Merry Christmas. Where to? Well, I don't know. We could stay and work on it tonight. Wouldn't do any good. We won't find it. I don't think so. Tell you he's kidding the priest. Build his hopes up. Might as well go tell him now. Merry Christmas. Seven twenty seven PM. We found Father Rojas. Frank told him how it was that we couldn't get the statue back by morning, but that we'd keep trying during the week. He said he understood. We told him we had to get on. 
As Frank and I started to leave, the doors at the main entrance to the church opened. It was a good 200 feet away. It was hard to be sure, but it looked like a small boy drawing a bright red wagon behind him. When he got closer, you could see he was no bigger than a pint of milk. He was a luminous-eyed little Mexican boy with a face as young as yesterday. The priest seemed to know him. Paquito? In the back of the wagon was the missing statue of the child Jesus. He picked it up gently and walked up to the priest. Father Rojas? He just stood there looking up at Father Rojas. It's Paco Mendoza, the boy from the parish. Ask him where he found it. ¿Dónde lo encontraste? No lo encontré, lo cogí esta mañana. He didn't find it, he took it. Why? ¿Por qué? Todo lo sueño Paquito rezó por un camisito rojo. Este año Paquito rezó a mí en Jesús. Yo prometí a mí en Jesús el primer viaje en mi camioncito. He says all through the years he's prayed for a red wagon. This year he prayed to the child Jesus. He promised that if he got the wagon, the child Jesus would have the first ride in it. He wants to know if the devil will come and take him to hell. That's your department, Father. No, el diablo. Jesus ama a Paquito mucho. We crossed over to the sanctuary. With the help of Father Rojas, the young boy replaced the infant Jesus in its rightful place, the crib in the nativity scene. Frank and I could have been wrong, but the small plaster statue seemed to approve. Mary, Joseph, the wise men, Gaspar, Melchior, Balthazar, the old shepherd, the young shepherd, the peasant, they all seemed to approve. Vuelve a tu casa, Paquito. The priest told the boy to go home. He took hold of his wagon and started the long walk out of the church. There wasn't much we could say. There wasn't much to say. We just stood there and watched him go. Halfway up, he turned to look back, and he went on out. I don't understand how he got that wagon today. Don't kids wait for Santa Claus anymore? It isn't from Santa Claus. The firemen fix old toys and give them to new children. Paquito's family, they're poor. and locations were changed. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department.
Ladies and gentlemen, the American Broadcasting Company brings to its entire network one of radio's most unusual programs. Pat Novak, for hire. says, Pat Novak for hire. You don't get in the blue book that way, but you don't embarrass your friends either. Because down on the waterfront in San Francisco, they don't separate the good and the bad. They let them run together. And before long, you got a caste system. You're either alive or dead. If you're on top, you keep fading the crowd and trying for sevens until you lose the dice. It's not the only way to play it, unless you like worms. I rent boats and do anything else that'll put a fast handle on a buck. But it doesn't always work out because down here all your luck is junior grade and trouble is trumps. I found that out Tuesday night. It was the first time I ever saw Reuben Calloway and the last time, too, if you like to keep a tidy record. It was about 7 o'clock and I just started back across the bay from Sausalito. You could still see Mount Tamalpais squatting on the Marin shore. Light brown near the top, but dark and black farther down, like a cupcake that's been in the oven a little too long. A low fog was beginning to squeeze in on the far side, so I kicked in the searchlight, and that's when I picked him up. He was struggling feebly with his face near the water, and he was almost bald, so that when the light hit him, he looked like a cantaloupe that somebody got tired of. I pulled alongside and started to haul him aboard. He brought most of the bay with him. Help me! Please help me. Yeah, well, wait till I get a hold of you, will you? Come on. There. Sit down. No, here. Lean against the gunnel. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Is the water red or you've been shot a little? Do you have to know everything? No, it's your load. Carry it, mister. Yeah. Move your feet. i got to get us ashore. If you like it, go ahead. But don't hurry for me. Well, if you feel that way about it, pick another spot to die and Go back in the bay where you'll have company. You've got to help me. I want you to... Get in touch with a girl named Alma Biggs. Yeah? You'll find her at the Empire Club out on Geary Street. My name's Reuben Calloway. Tell her about me. She'll pay you for it. What she do, collect bodies? Just give her this key. It's for a locker down in the bus station. Now, look, Pop, you don't know me. Suppose I use the key. You can't spend it. You better take the money. All right. Just see, Alma, and tell her it didn't work out. It didn't work out for me at all. I guess that's right, huh? On the big things, you're 100%. I don't need a check. Oh, here, set up. I told you I don't want you dying in here. Stop, beefing fella. You don't have all the bad luck. <laughs> They must have sent a fast chariot, because when I leaned over, the guy was dead. And he was working hard at it, too. He was a skinny little guy, all bent up and twisted in the bottom of the boat like an old paper clip. It wouldn't do any good to straighten him out, because he wasn't going to sleep easy. His eyes were open and rolling around at the sky as if he was on the make for a star. And the skin hung loose around his face so that when you touched it, it felt like an empty baked potato. I pushed him into a corner and started for Pier 19. When I got there, I hauled him on the dock and went down to call homicide. Must have been about 8.30 when I took a cab out to the Empire Club. It was a gambling joint out on Geary Street where they cut their whiskey and cards in different rooms. I asked the guy at the window if he knew Alma Biggs and he pointed her out with a roulette table. She was wearing a white satin evening gown. As I walked up behind her, 
I noticed she moved in rhythm with the roulette wheel. It was interesting. If it had been a merry-go-round, they'd have pinched her. I squeezed in next to her at the table, and I was thinking of trying it again when she started to talk. It's a tight fit. Are you sure you like it? I'm not going to stay long. That's what Rudolph Hess said. Make your bets, ladies and gentlemen. Gamblers, make your bets. Stake me, Alma. I can't afford you, darling. Well, go broke for Reuben Calloway, then. Four on the red. I ought to keep you for luck, darling. Will you comb your hair? I'll take the chips. They'd look bad on Calloway. Oh. It's too crowded here. Let's find a closet. All right. Did he look pretty? For a fish, he was all right. How are you? Pat Novak. I picked him up in the bay. He said to look you up and tell you it didn't work out. Hmm. That would please Turk. Yeah? Who's Turk? The reason it didn't work out. Is that all, Mr. Novak? Except for a key. It fits a bus station locker here. You keep it, Mr. Novak. It won't buy anything. Now, look, sweetheart, I picked up your boy and dried him out, but that's all. We were small friends at best, so the service has stopped. You can come to a slow stop for $200. Take the key and pick up what's in that locker. I'll get it from you later. Yeah. I'll meet you in an hour. Where's a good place? Your apartment? Well, it's a place. I'll find it in the book. I hope you don't mind. No, the thin walls will save me. What's in the locker? What would it prove? Proves you got a small mouth, Angel. Unless you're going to kiss it, don't worry. 9.30, then? All right. I'll bring the 200 with me. Don't worry about the dough. Oh? Because I scooped your chips off the table. See you later. She stood there watching me as I walked over to the cashier's window. Oh, she gave you a nice warm feeling like a Bunsen burner in the middle of your back. And as she stood there in the center of the floor, smiling, you knew she could turn a glacier into a steam bath at 400 yards. A nice little mouse that made you want to go home and test all the old traps. Well, I cashed in her chips, and the boy at the window shoved out 200 rocks and a pained look as if he'd just handed over his right lung. I got a cab and rode down to the bus station at 7th and Market. There were a few people sitting at the counter and a couple of old men on the benches waiting for somebody to get up and leave the funny papers. I went over near the wall and opened up the locker. It was a long trip for a small package. It was a square manila envelope and there was an address up in the corner. Reuben Calloway, photographer. I squeezed the envelope and it felt like photographs, but I wasn't sure. I started to close the locker when I turned and then I tumbled for the first time. It's like getting a drop of rain on your hand before you ever look up at the sky. The two of them were standing over by the cigar counter watching me. A guy with a heavy overcoat and a little small guy about the size of a hangnail. It wouldn't do any good to sit down because I knew they'd stay until somebody condemned the building, so I walked past him out onto the street. There was a cab standing right in front. Cab, mister? Yeah. Swing up toward the St. Francis, will you? Yeah. Now, look, you're going to be tailed, so brush up on your alleys. If you like it that way. Hey, you were supposed to take a left there on mission. I got a license. Where's yours? I told you to double back over market. Look, get out and walk if you don't like it. I've been bought, mister. Oh, my two friends. That's right. You should have come first. I ought to part your hair. You got more chance with them. Here we are. Where you going? You like alleys. That's what you're going to get. Yeah. Take it easy, fella. You're not going anywhere. You were nice while you lasted. Take it easy. You better walk up a wall. They'll block the alley. See? Crowded alley, huh? Yeah. Give me the envelope so we can all get out. Can Junior help you? Give me the envelope. Oh. There. Now let's see it. Yeah, it's still sealed. You all through? I don't know. I'll see. You like him, Joe? No. That's the way it is, mister. He don't like you. <laughs> I slid down like an old sock on a bony leg. I rolled over a couple of times and tried to stand up, but it wasn't easy. You might as well try to find a hair in a bowl of chopped suey. Well, it began to rain, and I figured it'd be easier to float out to the street, so I went to sleep. 
When I woke up, the rain hadn't helped the alley much. It's like washing your kid's face and finding out he was ugly to start with. The mud had washed up against the walls, and there was a thick, sour smell. And down the alley across the street, there was a part of a sign sticking out that said, Eats. And that isn't what you felt like at all. I started groping around to get up, and my hand hit the pictures. They were scattered all over like clothes in a boarding school. I picked them up and started for the street. On the way up in the cab, I got a chance to look at them, and they didn't make sense. There were six of them, and they were all just about the same, a bunch of mob scenes of that fire over in Oakland. I didn't have time to figure it out because the cab pulled up in front of the St. Francis, and I went in to call Alma Biggs and tell her the party was off. Part of that alley must have come with me, because when I walked into the lobby, the doorman looked at me as if I'd just blown up a nunnery. I tried the number once, but nobody answered. I decided to wait 20 minutes and call again. That was a mistake, because I just got in the booth and started to dial, and somebody started rapping on the door with a nickel. It was Hellman from Homicide. Hello, Novak. Come on out. You can't get a date in that suit. What do you want, Hellman? Come on out! You're a hard man to find. Well, you don't look in the right places. I'm a family man. Tell me about the dead guy. I don't know, Hellman. He died in my boat. That's all I know. He didn't say anything? Just sentimental stuff. His name's Reuben Calloway. Somebody threw him in the bay without instructions. I don't know a thing about him except he takes pictures. Yeah? I'll wipe off the drool. They're not your kind. Who are his friends? He's got new ones by now. I don't know, Hellman. How about that guy up in your couch? Huh? I just left your place. How about that guy on the couch? There's a gal up there, but that's all. Does she wear suspenders? Huh? Then take my word, it's a man. And you're going to tell me he's dead, Hellman? No, I'm not going to tell you he's dead, Novak. He may be a soft breather. <laughs> When Hellman mentioned the stiff up at my place, I knew we were going to be in low gear the rest of the night because Hellman isn't an easy guy. He wouldn't give his wife an aspirin if she had concussion of the brain. He took me out the side door and we rode up to my apartment. The dead guy was lying on the couch with his arms across his chest as if he wanted somebody to give him a lily or a way out of this. The lamp was shining down on his face and the light was distorted. But when you stood over him, you could see his face with the color of pressed seaweed. If he had anything to be happy about, you couldn't tell, because his mouth was open and hung over to one side like a loose change purse filled with old teeth. His clothes were rumpled and his shirt was open at his neck. You could see a chain around his neck and a silver medal in the dull light against his chest. It looked out of place and made you feel funny, like seeing a picture of a Madonna in a bowling alley. I watched him while Hellman made noise. He still looks like a man. Yeah? Who is he? George Leggett. What does that prove? Who his mother was? We're checking for a record. The gun, too. What gun? One was lying here on the floor. I want to know if it's the same gun that killed Reuben Calloway. Well, you'll need some prints. Anybody can buy a handkerchief. Where were you tonight? In an alley down near Mission Street. You like it down there? It's all right. You'd like it. I got shoved in and pushed around for these pictures. They don't look like the right kind of pictures. Well, I can't explain that, Hellman. Maybe they took the good ones. How do you fit in? Calloway gave me a key to a locker down on the bus station. It was for a girl named Alma Biggs. And the girl sent you down? That's right, with 200 bucks of running money. If you want to know about Calloway, look up a guy named Turk. Turk what? I don't know, Hellman. Maybe he's only got one name. Maybe the other was Stinker. You got a police file. Look him up. The girl mentioned him. That's all I know. We'll look him up. But I'm not going to forget you. One guy's dead on Pier 19. Another up here in your apartment. You mixed up, Novak. There's a connection. I'll shop around until I strike it. You couldn't strike oil on the filling station. You got a double murder shop for a pair of people. I'll shop far enough to get you, big shot. Far enough to see you fry. Well, you got the lard for it, Hellman. If you keep your mouth shut now, you can hold in the blood. Oh, Hellman talking. Yeah? Where'd you find out? <laughs> That'd make it easier. You sure the same gun killed them both? Yeah. Yeah, I'll be in. Well? Huh? Oh. Wrong number, Novak. They didn't give Hellman a sense of humor. They gave him a loud laugh instead. When he walked out of my place, he was smiling like a funny man who's just exposed Santa Claus. I didn't feel very funny myself. I took another look at those pictures, and I was as mixed up as a guy with a Mexican divorce. They were just ordinary pictures of a fire in Oakland. What made them so important? I was sure that Gunsel had taken some pictures, but, well, 
Were they any different than those? And why was Alma Biggs afraid to pick them up? And who was a guy named Turk? I was full of questions, but no answers, like some guy at a peace conference. If I went over it anymore, I'd be counting my toes. So I got out of there and looked up Jocko Madigan. Oh, he's a good guy, and he was a smart one, too, until he decided the only way you can get a good trade-in on hard luck is with a bottle of whiskey. I found him at Emilio's bar, patting Bill, the bartender, on the back with one hand and pouring jiggers of gin with the other. At the table down at Murray's in the place where Louis dwells. Jocko. Bah, bah, bah. Gentlemen, songsters of foreign spree, doomed from here to its end. Jocko, I want to talk to you. Shh, Patsy, I'm driving a Harvard man crazy. He's at the end of the bar. Well, stop drinking and listen to me. I've got to keep on drinking, Patsy, if I want to preserve any continuity in my life, because I don't drink to forget, but rather to remember. To remember all the pleasant events of my life. Uh, there were two of them, I think. All right, Jocko. The first was a girl I met many twilights ago, and the second was a summer night in St. Louis when a bartender felt crazed with the heat and set him up on the house. Will you stop it? I'm in trouble. Memory is a blessed toy, Patsy. But you have to be careful because it can be dangerous, like uh, giving a rifle to a small child for Christmas. It's true he can get some temporary pleasure out of it by shooting various neighbors, but sooner or later he's going to kill the only rich relative in the family. Jocko, I'm tired. And memory is the same way. So you're entitled to collect the few good ones you have. You're allowed to straighten them out and put them in order. After all, an old pool ball gets racked now and then. You all through? Yes. I've run out of memories. Hellman thinks I killed two guys ten miles apart. Wasn't it difficult? The same murder gun. The whole thing is tied up with some pictures. In uh, color? A guy by the name of Reuben Calloway died in my boat. He gave me a key to a locker downtown. The pictures were there. Is that one of them? Yeah. Take a look. Oh, if it's a group picture, they were a very unruly family. It's the Oakland Fire. Two Gunsels followed me and took some of the pictures. In the meantime, some guy got shot in my place. Everybody's after the pictures. Why? Have you seen the other pictures? No, I took an intermission. That's why you got to help. Now, you'll find Reuben Calloway's address in the phone booth. Get up there and go through his stuff, will you? It doesn't sound legal. Neither's a bum murder rap. Get up there and go through his pictures. Try to find anything that'll fit in with his set. Where are you going besides jail? I got to find a gal named Alma Biggs. Oh, you'll have trouble with a name like that. She's probably changed it. The locker key was tabbed for her, but she hired me to run her errands. Is she pretty? Yes, if you like a fast track. Now get up there, Jocko. Why can't I see her? Will you stop it, Jocko? Just get up there. Forget about her. She'd scare you to death. Yes. Well, at least I'd die hopeful. Good night, lover. <laughs> Finding Alma Biggs was quite a job. I knew she was around, but I couldn't get to her. It was like trying to get a peanut shell out of a back tooth. I called the Empire Club, but they didn't know anything about her. I went through all the phone books and the city directories, and I didn't get anything but a sore thumb. And I didn't do any better with the hotels. I sat in lupos and called them all one by one. And By one o'clock, I knew more desk clerks than a vice squad cop, but no Alma Biggs. Finally, I went out to the Empire Club and started talking to the cabbies. About 15 minutes later, one pulled up and remembered taking a girl in a satin evening gown up to an apartment on the hill. I called Hellman and rode up there to check the names. Alma Biggs had an apartment on the second floor. I knocked on the door and she didn't answer, so I tried it. The lights were out, so I closed the door and groped over to the desk. I should have noticed the draperies as I passed because they were full of people. Wait a minute. All right, now. Wait a minute, Mr. Nilpack. Stop breaking things. Someday you may want to mend me. Uh, do you always sleep in the curtains? Do you always talk this long in the dark? Turn on the light. Yeah. I wanted to see who you were. George Leggett, maybe. Oh, do you know him? We're roommates. He died on my couch tonight. Anything serious or just humdrum death? He's satisfied. What do you know about him? Well, I never heard anybody say a bad thing about him. Of course, I never heard anybody mention him. Now, look, Angel, it's late. Who's George Leggett? Why do you care? Because homicide cares. They got Calloway and Leggett back to back, and they want my skin. Mm, it's a nice skin, darling. Where are the pictures? Unless you're a social worker, you're not going to like them here. Let me see. They're not all here. Yeah, I figured that. Where are the other pictures, Patsy? In some Goniff's album. 
Two of them jumped me down near Mission Street. Who are they? We never got that friendly. Well, there couldn't have been two of them. Well, maybe the little guy was just window dressing, but he gave the right answers. Patsy, I think you're a liar. You're nicer than homicide. I want those pictures. You do. I'm going to take them away from you. Well, if I had them, that's a big enough gun to do it. Get the pictures, Patsy. It's a bad time for murder, Angel. Homicide's working this week. I haven't time, Patsy. I'll push you down like a blade of grass. Get the pictures. Now, look, sweetheart. I took a job for 200 bucks. It covers a tandem murder rap and a sapping down on Mission Street, but it won't cover big talk from you. Now, put the gun away or I'll bend you hard. Don't move up when you talk. You're around behind. Come on, give it to me. Up it, Patsy. Feels good. Let it go or take the pain. Drop it. You don't have to hang on. I'm not a barbell. You're handy now. Who's Turk? Stop it. You're hurting my arm. There's a guy named Turk. I want to know who he is. You're late for that. Who is he? Go ahead. Tear it off. You'll die, Ignis. Yeah. You sound blue, Novak. Oh, what do you want, Hellman? I want to give you a reason. We got the coroner's report on George Leggett. Yeah? He died in your apartment. The blood off your carpet looks good on these slides. All right, so the murderer sold me the rug. So what, Hellman? So we ran down George Leggett's record. A Detroit gunman who got out here six weeks ago. Yeah? He traveled for years with a guy named Turk Spaniel. Now, that's your boy. You better find him. We already have. Don't tell me he's up on the couch. He was born too soon for you. We check with the Detroit police. What'd they say? They know all about Turk Spaniel. He was killed nine years ago in West Detroit. But they found the guy that did it and sent him up to Lansing for life. Yeah? Yeah. He was a guy named Joe Biggs. Say hello to your girlfriend. <laughs> Well, I didn't talk to the girl because I knew she'd close up faster than a Dublin meat market on Friday. I left her and went down to the Chronicle morgue to find out what I could about Turk Spaniel. Hellman had covered it. Spaniel talked too much, and Joe Biggs killed him and left him growing out of a ditch like an old weed. I didn't know where to turn now. With Turk gone, who was after those pictures besides Alma Biggs, and what did they prove? I knew the answer was there. Probably in plain sight, like a blimp on a football field, but I couldn't get near it. It was past two when I got back to my apartment and the phone was screaming for help. Yeah. Hello, Patsy. This is Jocko. What'd you find out? That Callaway was quite a photographer. Yeah? You should see some of the pictures. Ooh, I'm in love with you. All right, Jocko. Did you find anything? There's a check for a thousand dollars from Alma Bates. Yeah, what else? Some more pictures of the Oakland Fire. One of them looks good. Yeah? It's just like the rest, except in the background, something is circled with a red pencil. That'll do it, Jocko. And there's a clipping here with another picture. I can't tell, but I think they match. What's it say? Well, it's all about... Jocko, what's the matter? Are you all right, Jocko? Jocko, you all right? After Jocko's call, I grabbed a cab and rode up to Calloway's apartment. When I got there, Jocko was sitting in the middle of the floor as sad as a steer on a sheep ranch. He hadn't seen who hit him, and the picture was gone, so was the clipping. I asked him if there were any negatives around. He said no. That meant that somebody was still on the prowl for those negatives. So I called Hellman and briefed him. He said he'd meet us at Reuben Calloway's studio in ten minutes. When we got there, it was dark, but I sensed Hellman in the back room. Turned out to be a couple of pans of acid, but Hellman was there going over the negatives. All this guy did was take pictures. Let me take a look, will you, Hellman? Can you spot the right one here, Jocko? Hold him up to the light. All right. Here are the fire pictures. Uh, how about this one? No, no, I had that one. Yeah, that's it. And, and this fellow back here is the one that was circled. Hold it up so I can see. Hello, Turk. You waited too long. Give me the picture, mister. All that gun will do is make noise, Spaniel. It won't make enough to keep a secret. Just hand me the picture. Somebody knows you're alive now. The picture's for laughs. It's your word against mine. And I'll be so far away I can't hear the argument. Let's have it. Don't give it to him, Novak. Yeah, I'll give it to him. You take it away, Hellman. Thanks, Novak. That alley taught you manners. Just stand over there. I want to remember the way you looked. Don't worry. I'll tell you about them, Turk. Huh? Keep backing into this gun. It's going to show around your breastbone. The guns are getting cheap. You better drop yours, Spaniel. Over there. Hmm. You look the same, Turk, or almost the same. You got this all wrong, Alma. Joe doesn't look the same. Nine years in the cooler and you lose your personality. 
Please, Alma, don't do anything crazy. After nine years, you lose almost everything. Joe's lost everything but me. Down on the floor, Spaniel. I want you on your knees. Please. Alma, you got it wrong. I got it all right, Turk. Because Joe wouldn't lie to me. When he said he didn't kill you, I knew you were alive. Please, Alma. Down on the floor beside the table. Go easy, baby. You got a copper here. I can't hurt him, Novak. Turk Spaniel's legally dead. All you can do to a dead man is kick up the dust. Please, Alma. You're not seeing this right. I'm going to have a better chance than you. You couldn't see, Spaniel. You couldn't see your way back to help Joe out. You look good on your knees. Over by the table. Leave that asshole alone, sweetheart. I'm going to help him see. With a whole panful of it. I'm going to help you see, Spaniel. Please. Please, Alvin. You wouldn't do that. You got the short end of the bat. You better look at him, Jocko. Don't bother Unless you're a baby doctor. We may need you, lady. Not for this copper. Remember, Turk Spaniel's dead. Detroit says so. He looks live now. He can't be dead there and live here. I like your climate, but it's not that good. You can't see me, Turk. So I'll bet you can hear me walk out of here. Goodbye, Turk. I'll send you a cane. Hellman managed to get most of the story out of Turk Spaniel. Reuben Calloway stumbled into the whole thing, and he didn't know what hit him. He went over to Oakland to take some pictures of the fire, and he got a picture of Spaniel in the crowd. Spaniel saw him and trailed him over to this side. He had to get the pictures because back in Detroit, he'd framed Joe Biggs with a riddled-up body and skipped out of the country. He'd been away until a few weeks ago, and... Now he was waiting for a boat out of San Francisco, so he had to stay dead. He sent George Leggett after the pictures, but Leggett figured it was a good way to double-cross him and stay in the clear, so he tipped off Alma Biggs, who'd come out here on a lead a few weeks before. Turk finally tumbled. With a local gunsel, he killed Calloway and left Leggett in my apartment where he trailed him. <laughs> it almost worked out, but he didn't get to that shop in time. Well, Hellman asked only one question. When I first met her, did I know that Alma Biggs was that hard? No. In that satin evening gown, I didn't think so. American Broadcasting Company has just brought you the fifth of a new series, Fat Novak for Hire, starring Jack Webb. Fat Novak is produced and directed by William P. Rousseau. Jack O'Madigan is played by Tudor Owen. Inspector Hellman is played by Raymond Burr. Music was composed and conducted by Basil Adlam. In our cast were Yvonne Fady, Charles McGraw, Herb Butterfield, and Herb Ellis. This program is being released to our servicemen and women overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Be with us again next week when over most of these same ABC stations, we will bring you Pat Novak for Hire. This program came to you from Hollywood. Now, a brief reminder. There is no mystery to this statement. Wherever they serve, at home or abroad, the men who wear the uniform of the United States are men of whom we can be proud. Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard. All of them serve our country and us with pride and honor. It's ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.